Okay, here we are. Ducks Don't Get Cold Feet, podcast number 17. So we're, we're, there's something a bit exciting about today. We have DJ Madness in the house. Good afternoon, everybody. And you are here in what is our first podcast in this new kind of office area we've got going on. What's your first thoughts? It's technically not 100% finished yet. You can hear his fantastic bathrooms need some work. A little bit. Went old. in there a second ago. A little bit blue. I'm sure you know it's a loo. It's a blue loo. <laughs> it's a bit of a. It's a bit of a. You know, bit of seventies retro. Dude, I love it. I'm all over it. I well, you, I, I wasn't you. all over it, but yeah. uh, well, I wouldn't have. Hate, I wouldn't have hoped you're all over it. Actually, <laughs> but no, very... no. Congratulations on the new um, abode. Well, thank you very much, and. Um, it's Tom Cotter. Tom, yeah. yeah. So, so most, I, I actually saw you DJing so many times as a youngster, which was just the other day. Um, and in that time, I had no idea your name was Tom. So it's it's um it's earth shattering for me. And I guess for people that don't know, they might not know that you you're, you're big. You're big name DJ. <coughs> you madness used to, used to be DJ Madness. Yeah. Back in the day, I mean, you started in the early '90s. Yep, correct. As so. a special guest at the old Arca Bar. Yes. Bar yep. That's the um, well. If you want to take it right back, yeah. I think yeah. We let's go right. Let's possibly. Go. When, when did you first start DJ? Okay, so um, the first time, well, I was encapsulated by the concept of a DJ. Uh, was my old man was a, uh, a, a avid s- a supporter of this. Panthers, the South Adelaide Football Club, um, in their club rooms in St Mary's, and uh, you know, I'd be there most days actually. By the end of it, because Dad was working there yep. for a period, but um, Saturday nights was the night where they'd have um, presentations after the game, and uh, at that particular time where the kitchen's kind of closing up, the presentations are done, the bingo tickets have been cleared. Incidentally, that was one of my first jobs: clear the tickets, collect the glasses. Just have a lot of fun <laughs> with that. But um, at a particular what about time, the meat raffle. The meat raffle, that was all done and dusted ah, as well, okay. yeah. Yep. All that stuff, oh. put it all to bed. Um, and uh, a bloke by the name of uh, Barry Pollard in the day uh, was sort of the in-house resident DJ guy, and he was responsible for playing Macho Man and, you know, whatever kind of songs, when the player of the day comes up, best on ground, all that sort of thing, presentations over and done with. And then they'd dim the lights and it would turn into a disco. Like the pin spots had come on, the, the disco lights start spinning. And back in the 80s, you know, I mean, break dancing was becoming, you know, a popular thing. Yeah. Uh, so we'd hang out with the DJ and they'd have guest guys come in and play. So this other guy, Ivan, down down the uh, uh, neck of the woods, he'd come in and, and apparently still around. I've spoken to some old uh, fossil type DJs and they can confirm that he's still around the place. But, um, mate, I used to just stand there and watch these guys swap the music and just be oh, so into music anyway. I just loved it. And just to see it unfold on the night and bring people to dance and, and entice people to stay and all these kind of things. Obviously, the oldies would be like, oh, fuck it. we're going home. <laughs> this dark, dim shit is, you know, place turned into a club, whatever. But, um, yeah, I was really captivated. And the, and the first time that this bloke told me, oh, I made $350 a night doing this, I'm like, Kidding me? Like you get paid to do this? Yeah, it was way too much fun, and it was all on seven-inch vinyl, of course, on this old set of turntables that had light switches that you'd hit to engage them because twelve hundreds. So there's no magnetic, no magnetic turns. To- <laughs> wasn't DJing in in what you would probably class these days as as being a performance, but um, you know, swapping the music over, and man, I just got straight into it. And the old man himself went and bought a Technics component amp set, which had a pitch control on the. Yeah, on the yeah. turntable. So, um, you know, wanted to get out and buy all of the compilation albums at the time, the best, the 18 tracks and all that sort of thing. Um, and you'd have your favourites and I had a little bit of uh, like a book that I'd write the names and artists of songs in alphabetical order so I could easily recall which compilation they came from. Yeah. So I'd start making tapes or uh, playing at friends' parties and all that sort of thing uh, as, as an offshoot from there. But, um, you know, mate, I was 11 or 12 uh, and I really had to just – put it aside and concentrate on my primary school studies because even though these days you laugh so you know it's it's it man it was it, it wasn't a serious game back then these days of course a kid can get up and hit the main stage at well probably pre-covid yeah actually but um yeah hit the main stage of twenty five thousand people no worries but it was a different game back then and yeah i had to finish off year seven going into year eight and um yeah mate that's when uh 
you know, probably yourself, you started hearing stuff on the radio. You you sort of hit the clubs, went to the Tomsley, McMahons and yeah. stuff and, and got to see some amazing DJs play there later on down the piece. But, you know, going to those those clubs in town, La Rocks and, um, uh, yeah, some of those early spots in the, uh, in the, in the 90s time and that's when you're exposed to this whole new range of material that you just w heard and couldn't have heard before. Yeah. It didn't exist. So techno music is, I guess, what we were calling it. A lot of it was house. Yeah. Some other different styles. But, uh, yeah, generally speaking, that was sort of the inroads to uh, what was the modern day DJ Madness from, you know, the early 90s through till, yeah, today. And if you go back into early 90s, uh, like I was, you, what you said then was the techno which was dance, dance music. Like technically it just came out as dance, bit industrial in the yep. early piece. And totally. you had a fair bit of breakbeat uh, coming through yep. from 70s. From the UK, yep. Yep. samples, samplers yep. started getting used. And yep. the only time, like this, these day, this day and age, you hear a bit on, you know, Fresh FM or you, you, there's, there are radio stations that accommodate for some dance music and techno and all, all multi facets of techno because it, dance music is a huge range. Yeah. But back then you, you didn't hear it anywhere. Mm -mm. anywhere had, at all because yeah. you couldn't hear it other than getting your own tape. <laughs> Ripping it off at a, a show and that happened, yeah. no doubt about it. Bootlegs were, were popping out. But yeah. there were a couple of specialist radio shows uh, on, uh, well, it's 3D radio now, but Triple M yep. is what it was called, even though Triple M was something else somewhere else and they bought the license rights here in SA for it. But that was the station where you could hear Georgie Knight do Dreaming Daisies on a Tuesday night, or you could hear uh, Easy G, who was running a show back then in the early 90s, and they were playing this kind of music because he was doing Pulse, all those underage events, which yeah. you probably went to yeah, as well. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I, yeah. I, and yeah. that was the only way you yeah. could get to hear this stuff. It was either these two or three, you know, specialist radio shows. There's no internet. There's no other ways of being exposed to it other than going to a club. So it was like this funnel. Fuck, do you feel old? There's no fucking internet. This guy's like going, oh, fuck. No there internet. was no, Imagine yeah, no one. such thing. No, no dial up, no nothing, man. It was, um, it, and to be exposed <clears throat> to it, you had to go out or listen to these shows or tape those shows and get stuck into it. And of course, Central Station was the uh, import record store on Twin Street in those days. Um, well, up in Gaze Arcade where it sort of started, same yep. sort of area. Yep. And, um, and that was the sort of, the, well, the momentum that, that kicked off the careers of the likes of um, HMC uh, and uh, a Groove Terminator, yep. Angus, Brendan, they all sort of emerged around the same time. And thanks to that record store, uh, we got access to, you know, world-class material uh, from a from a, a, a DJ's point of view, because otherwise you'd have to travel to be able to get this stuff. You'd either go to Sydney or Melbourne. They yeah. had pretty good stores, but the Adelaide one was the best. <laughs> that's why we ended up with the best DJs. It, well, that's, Simple as and that. That's, and it it's so true. Like I, I recall at school, like year 10, 11, and 12, blowing all of my money on records yeah. and, and comics at, and Central Station. And that's what you do. You get a big... You pile of stuff, pile yeah. of stuff, straight in the listening booth, yeah. And then you just sit there and go, Yep, no, 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 break through it, yeah. Funny story about that, too. Um, I, I don't know how many times this happened to me going to see Tony at Central's. You'd go in there, you'd listen to the records, you'd be like, Oh man, there's just which ones aren't can't I take because I just don't have enough money to buy them yep. all. So it's always like whittling down, whittling down. Get to the end where you're paying the money, you get out, you go to get your car out of the car park, <laughs> and you realize you'd spent. All, all your, money. your money. You couldn't even get your car out. I was like, Ugh. you go back and see Tony. He's like, oh, man, can I have three bucks to get my car out? Like, oh, <laughs> man. Like, how many times did that happen? <laughs> Probably every Too time you guys times. are refunding records. That, oh, hang on. I've overshot my mark. It was ridiculous, yeah. yeah so so you, if you're talking about music styles, um, did they change with you? Like, you know, in the early days? Oh, yeah, what? totally, man. I was, I was more up for the – I guess most of us sort of were – rebellious enough to want to hear that harder edge techno or trance music because that was the new stuff on the yep. block, you know, for for what the time and, and it had the energy and, and sort of the exclusivity and and all of the ingredients as a youngster that you want to be exposed to and, and be involved with from a cultural point of view as well as musical and, and all the rest. It was just so much fun. Um, and in terms of styles, yeah, I mean, the – the, yeah, it was breakbeat sort of stuff. And then the tempo started getting faster as well. A lot of the stuff that I think we were hearing was around the 120, 125, 130, the Belgian techno, all that yeah. sort of stuff. And then as time went on, um, you get 
exposed to a bit more UK stuff. And of course, it breached the 140 BPM barrier yeah. with some of the breakbeat the rave music. And then it just got crazier and crazier. Before you know it, it's up to 160. Yeah. But then drum and bass comes around. Yeah. It's 180. Yeah. It's like, this is really fast moving stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whether yeah. you're, dra- you're going in, in, in real time or at half beat, it's you know it's got that versatility to it, but yeah, so many different styles, man. I mean, we could we could rap on for weeks on this JP. Yeah, that's true. Central Station. This is a series of podcasts. Yeah, this yeah, is, yeah, you know. We, we want to break it down. We, we don't want to. <laughs> we don't want to keep everyone in so much suspense. They can't like what's happening. <laughs> if I go to Central Station, you would have seen a few interesting things at Central Station. Yeah, well, working uh, working at the coalface there uh, on Rundle Street, and then we moved to Rundle Mall, and yeah. I eventually found myself at um at marion we opened up a, a second store there and then later on i was at actually at electric circus records which was on east yep. terrace and then so collectively standing at the counter for a good sort of 12 or 15 years give or take because i was processing out the back as well um but yeah oh the it was always the fun experience i suppose myself tim allison mc tim um you got nigel reynolds agent 86 one of australia if not one of the world's finest djs oh, ever mate. guy's incredible he's got he's cross everything um hang on dj nigel yes like he <laughs> he's not a very big guy like no. he's probably smaller than me a bit tinier but every place he rocked up to play he had hot chicks carrying, carrying his, his records. boxes yeah like, his thing. these record boxes are not light, nope. right? And everywhere he rocked up, a couple of girls carrying his record boxes. What a fucking rock star. He was a pimp. Yep. Yeah. Pimp. And, and still is. Madness on... Uh, <laughs> I, I, there's so many things that I saw him do that actually blew my mind away in regards to doing things because he just wanted to fuck shit up. Yeah. And yeah, rocking I mean. up to a set at 11 o'clock, it's starting to peak up and he'll just bang, he'll go into like a... Slow, OBP, yeah, yeah, just slow break beat, and people are like, "What the fuck?" Yeah. He's got some Collyonis, that kid. You know uh, what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But he, he is. I've he would have no idea who I, I am. But I've had so many conversations with him about, yeah. like, uh, just about his music because the way he can piece things together yeah. from nowhere it's, and genres like one second is yeah. rock, the next it's you know techers again, and then there's some. Piano it's phenomenal. house gem comes out of nowhere and then back into hip hop. It's like, yeah. he still does it at 161 uh, in, in, in Melbourne. Melbourne. Yeah. yeah. yeah which I follow actually, him on. Shouldn't say that he is always doing it because these days, uh, yeah. Melbs. Do we, yeah, uh, we don't yeah. have to say anything about their premiere, do we? Oh, no, no, that's no. Good. Andrews, we'll, oh, don't get me started. Stay on away from that then. <laughs> Wait, who the hell would want to go there? Yeah, yeah. Well, no fucking no one. <laughs> but um, the point with, yeah. So, that's why 15,000 people have moved here in the last six weeks. So <laughs> that's a fun. Hallelujah. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we were manning the, um, the counter, uh, yeah. <laughs> obviously at, at centrals and the best part of our day usually <laughs> usually involved um someone coming in and asking about a song oh. um uh, by singing it you know oh we heard this in the club on the weekend and <laughs> it was like this game that, and tim and i were like almost challenging each other okay hey, we got one we got one okay no worries and you're trying to embarrass the fuck out of whoever yeah. it is that's yeah. coming it goes <laughs> like mm, 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 so, <laughs> yeah let's go uh kaleidoscopes let's go and they say the weirdest words like um the cool banana the cool banana it's like oh yeah that's the funk phenomena here's a copy and they're like how did you guys get that and see <coughs> over the years we got real fucking good at this like it, it, real good at it like someone would come in okay strum like you know half a bar or something we're like got it and they're like you guys are good <laughs> <laughs> you guys are really, really good. So, um, yeah, that was a game. Oh um, my god, I was one of those fucking people. That was <laughs> I was sitting there, did, 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 yeah, and yeah, they're yeah. like, yeah, okay, no to the god of Abraham. Yeah, that's done. <laughs> James Brown said, yeah, got that. I one. like that. I got one. I like that one. Goes that goes, um, oh, 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 and it's sort of opera. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, um, uh, I can tell you that one. Uh, it's uh, Yes, yes, yes. yes. It's oh, Fortuna. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you're the f- you're the first person that's ever done that. Yeah, yeah. I've tried to so, get that track over and over again. It's not bad. In fact, the trick with that one because it played at thirty three at the rave parties, you could play at forty five. So it turns from one hundred and thirty five BPM tune into this raging one hundred and sixty five number, and that's when you see the kids get dropping. Yeah. yeah, it was really good. 
It's powerful tune, though. It's a powerful. Da, da, da. Yeah. And that got, you know, the rinse out at the Ark and all the other places around town. I can't believe you got that right. Mm. I'm impressed. All On Media work. Records, I read it. Yeah, I could probably give you the cat number. <laughs> One, two, so, zero, six, oh, we haven't even got past Central Station. So Central Station, uh, like for, you're right. Yeah, sometimes I went to Melbourne and Sydney. Yep. Both, so I, I remember great shops too. I remember going there, and I've I've just found a few pallets in this in the warehouse that I'm going through because I got to get rid of it, full of shit. And I was looking through photos, and I have twenty photos of Central Station record Ooh. store, not not Adelaide. Oh, the uh, that shit, so, and with that shit, I just shredded them today because there was nothing. There's nothing. It was like some nothing soft. of significance. Yeah, they <clears> even <throat> had CDs. That was just a disappointment. Oh, really? <laughs> thinking. Who the fuck does that? <laughs> so, somebody who's so, not strong enough <laughs> to carry divided about. <laughs> <laughs> Man up, yo! Oh shit! So, so oh. You know, your music style uh, originally, I mean, as a 12-year-old, what, what sort of music were you listening to back then? I, I mean, obviously, you're playing, you didn't have anything to do with the Glenelg Football Club recently, did you? I haven't had, I've only had a small amount to do with the Glenelg Football Club. What's um, wrong? Hang on. Oh, oh um, his first day on the job. That's that. <laughs> his first day on the job. What, what's wrong? Yeah, that shit. Do, that, do, um, do, do, fuck, I can't believe you got that. That's fucking impressive. That is pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, I got some more um, uh, Glenelg jokes too, if you want them. Um, oh, you know, because they just got busted for that. I don't know anything about that. I'm not up to with the. Uh, no, they just got busted because they had a COVID thing. <sighs> oh, that's nasty. Mm, no, but, the, um, but what they got busted for is having a, a dance party. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Are you right? No, I'm just making sure it's, it's not. It's not flashing. Oh, that's all right. I'm sure the volume is fine. Um, back up. Yep. yep. Um, so with Glenelg, um, hang yeah. on. I think we need to stop him. Oh yes, yes, yes. COVID's got. He has one one role to play when he's here, and one of those is making sure that everything works. <clears throat> one job. Ten minutes into the job. <laughs> Ten minutes. <sighs> Uh, yeah, you get what you pay for, man. I've uh, never not hit record. Where at least he recorded. Hey, you get one <laughs> Hey, Rise Time. <laughs> Sorry. Do you want to Okay, that's it. <laughs> Classico. All right, let's go. Um, You better not cut that out. <laughs> I know. I, 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 Keep it. Keep it in. All right. Um, radio, so... I felt. Uh, yeah, um, what were you listening originally listening to? So the music that we were um, uh, enjoying. Well, yeah. I, I suppose like anyone, you're you're very heavily influenced by what your parents listen to. So my folks played way too much ABBA. Yeah. When I was a kid, as a result, I fucking hate it. Like <laughs> it does my chops in to listen to it. In fact, I've only ever played in my entire history of being a DJ an ABBA song once. Was that just a, that <clears> must <throat> have been to piss someone off? Private. Yeah. No, it was a private. Um, Event, I think it was this lady's 70th, a client of mine. I do Apple Solutions Consulting. I help her out all the time. She's like, oh, you're a DJ. I can get you to play. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> okay. And Dancing Queen had to go down. I'm like, oh. like, it melts my mind to think about this. Yeah. I can tell you, though, my old man <laughs> never, ever let me live this one down. That is flushing his copy of the ABBA LP down the, t trying to flush it down the toilet at home. And along with the South LA uh, ties, because I thought they were shit too, but only because they were playing poorly. They hadn't won a final since 1964. Yeah. In fact, the Beatles were here that last year. That's how long it's been. Far out. Centennial Paul, yep. Yeah. Really? Um, so, Obviously, way before you are born. Mm, yeah. So, you know, like anyone, Beatles were played a lot. Um, the Eagles got a fair thrashing back in those days. But then when the 80s turned around, for me, it was all about Kiss and... You know, I guess pop music in general, yeah. but then as the eighties rolled on, and you've got sort of electro styles that were emerging, and the dance came with that. Um, I guess with break dancing as well through the, the club that I was going to on a Saturday and hearing the DJs play, that really influenced my style or taste in music as well because it became a little more sort of synth oriented, and um, all that electronic music was starting to 
become of age. Uh, Ice House, of course, another all the flowers, another brilliant Australian act in excess. You know, these are the things that I guess most of us all grew up with at that particular point. Um, but then, the, yeah, the sound. I guess I, I got really anti um, guitars at one point, though. Like with the with the electronic music, anything with a guitar, I just nut park it. Yeah. I'm like, I just don't care. Acoustic, I think, went for me first, and then it was like the electric stuff. <laughs> nut. See you later. It's got a guitar in it. I don't want it. Simple as that. I had a real aversion to it. Um, as the more soul, you know, either the harder techier stuff, or yeah. then later on the more soulful house sort of stuff. But then through that, I fell back in love with the sound of the guitar, and then it sort of evolved into, you know, a more understanding of how beautiful the instrument is and how well it can be played and all that sort of stuff. So it's kind of me and the vocals. Yeah. Right. Like, um. Vocals and music, mm. ruining it. Prefer the instrumental version. Children, Rob Miles. Uh, just, Doesn't need a vocal. Just minimal. Never had one. Total minimal. Yep. And strip it back. Strip it right back to what it should be. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's so funny about music. Anyone can have it. So we're, we're talking, you had some, you worked with uh, MC Tim. Yeah. So, you know, he was everywhere at, uh, for a stage there. I don't know. I haven't, I actually was doing something with the car wash a while ago, but I, I don't well, know. I'm, well, I met him at the Arca Bar. Yeah. So, um, I mean, my first gig there was quite interesting. My mate ATB was uh, playing there. Jeff had given him a job. He's working there every Friday and Saturday. And the first time I even used a, a, a 1200, really, or a, um, a crossfader was in the Arca Bar playing. And in those days, the decks used to actually face um, the wall, which was a mirror. So you'd actually face this way and look in the mirror to see how the dance floor was going. It was a really bizarre sort of thing. Um, and, yeah, it's sort of thrown into the, the pitfalls of, oh, he play this one next like man i was just hanging out there pushing some lights buttons and smoke machine whatever oh wow do this that's a lot of fun and it just man it put me into a different world like djing from that point it was just like this elevation sort of thing it's yeah it still freaks me out every now and then when i'm you know in the thick of it because most of the time you're not even in control of what you're doing how you're playing what you choose it's all about sort of the preparation what you've got there on the night but you're just the conduit for the energy in the room in most instances. So being a little more connected with music or knowledgeable about it really just is the building blocks of what energy you're going to expel whilst you're playing that music. And that's how I feel about it still to this day. If you're playing to a shit crowd, you ain't going to do a good show. It's as simple as that. If they're not feeling it, the connections aren't there, it's going to be crap. It's as simple as that. Like, That's so true though. It so, is. So you, you go into the psychology of a set mm. and it's different every time? Totally, yeah. Off of me, yeah, yep. Um, it's completely different. I'll make a, a a time put aside. Usually, you know, it could be equal to the amount of time that's needing to be played. Yeah. Most of the times, depending on how organised you are, because I'm ridiculously organised. I've got all of my records. Are B you? BPM. Is that real? Yeah, yeah, for real. I've got little stickers on all of them. So in the early days, I used to use a stopwatch. Count how many beats in fifteen seconds times by four. Write it on there. Then I got anal enough after at some stage to root key the lot as well. So 125 in C or it's a 123E and then you work out through calculation of how much you need to move the pitch control and how much that varies the key as to, to be able to key, yeah. key mix, not just beat mix, yeah. but key mix. And um, that wasn't – roughly at the end of it all, half of your records won't mix with the other half. It won't sound good in a long mix. So it's about determining which ones are cut and shut yeah. So beat over beat, bass line, bang, straight out in terms of a beat mix or swapping a track over with the, you know, beat mixing skill so set. So you'd mark that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And take the time to develop that whole thing. Um, but that wasn't until sort of much later. But I, I, it was the only way that I could formulate after I'd sort of collected collect one box of records, how am I going to organise these? So to me, it just seemed systematic to have it in BPM range because that way you're not playing anything too slow with something too fast. And therefore, you're not dealing with the chipmunks in terms of the way that the, you know, okay. so it's rel they're playing relative to one another, yeah. is what I think I'm saying. And by doing that process, you remember how fast they all are. So then when it comes to trying to find one in my collection, I can tell you it's 125. That's 132. Yeah. I was working on a project with a, a guy that I'm training with Logic, an audio making software uh, around the world came up. And I know it's 121 because it's got 121 written on it in the front of my box. I know it's in E because that's the root key of the record I've written it on there so you just remember these things it's pretty hard to do when you got eight and a half thousand pieces of black vinyl sitting around yeah there. I was going to say uh, it's that's dedication 
to be out, to actually hey I know what's in every track. Well, that was the for me just yeah it's like a simple top line of, of data that helps me organize it. I can't do it by um, year. I don't want to organize it by uh, alphabetically. Yeah. I keep it sort of in genre, like that's the techno, that's the yeah. drum and bass, hip hop. Yeah. But then, yeah, keep the, the BPMs relative within each of the, the genres in storage. And therefore, yeah, it just makes it easy to find. But uh, yeah, MC Tim, man, we started working together uh, at the Arca Bar. Um, he'd come back from a big overseas trip. And, um, yeah, we'd forged a really good working relationship in those days. And then when I finished up at the Ark, it was sort of winding up, I suppose. Um, he came to me because he just started a job at Central Station and I managed to get in on the back of his recommendation with Tony. And then we started working at um, uh, Venus together, yep. which was something Jeff was running for a while. That was basically college crowd. So, again, hate to mention it, but Macho Man was getting played in these dudes' college crowd off of the tops and do this thing on the stage and we'd have to do it like twice a night or something stupid. <sighs> um, I mean, I worked at the Colonnades where I used to have to play the bus stop and the Madison – I'm not shitting you. Three times a night, two nights a week. This is like nine till five in the morning, long ass shifts to the same 15 to 20 people yeah. for five months. Yeah. Hey, what the fuck? Like, yeah, that's- yeah, cue the Twilight Zone music. <laughs> like, it, it was, at, yeah, <clears throat> ridic. But um, <clears throat> we then went on to do the planet after that. So well, that's a big that, gig. That was a big gig, yeah. So that was big for a fair while. Yeah. Well, we jumped in on, on '96 when um, when Bill Spa took over the management of it and appointed a, a, a general manager who thought a jukebox was going to do the job. Yep. They had these restaurants that were going to yeah. be doing this, and and yep, jukebox. Oh, I'll kill it. You know, eighteen hundred people. I love it. No worries. Uh, <laughs> luckily, they got some consultants in. You know. No, uh, yeah, no, you want these guys. So, yeah, we, we managed to get ourselves a Guernsey. And, uh, yeah, Tim was the mainstay. Man, we powered through well, till 99 or well, something there. Let's, you mentioned 1996. Yes. Voted best up-and-coming DJ at the South Australian Dance, Dance Music, Music Awards. Awards. Yes, yes. So Mate, that was, yeah, a complete that, reflection on the amount of people we're playing to each week. Yeah. So, you know, you had on a uh, – we weren't doing Wednesday, but we were playing Thursday – they could have 1,000, 1,500 through. <clears throat> Friday night was the more commercial night. Myself and ATB play that together. And we could be playing to, you know, three to three and a half thousand yep. on, on a Friday. But Saturday night was, that was the business right there. Um, the place had opened at nine. We had 1,800 people in the joint before the first track yeah. was dropped. Yeah. Because everyone wanted to save what, the money it, having to pay to get in. Correct. They were always, you know, 1,800 strong. Bang, first track, doesn't matter what it was, some deep, WUK garage tune, floors full. Let's have it like just gangbusters fun, crazy for the for the first number of years where we didn't even really have to try. It was just a question of playing what came in that week. Yeah, it really was and so. Mixing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, the energy sort of progressed out throughout the course of the night, but so much fun for us playing to that many people. And ultimately, the good thing about it was that eighteen hundred people strong when you open. Um, ultimately, you wanted to get those people out of there so payers come in. So we play deep enough music to spook people out, yeah. get them to leave, make room for more. That's where they made their money on the door. Yeah. But the lineup all the way down to Perry Street, yeah. you know, um, to Pulteney. You used to to go <coughs> to Planet. You used to really want to know one, know someone because the was, lineup would kill you. Yeah, especially if you miss getting there first thing. Yeah, and, and that was that was at a time where Heaven was the competing well, venue. Heaven was cranking too, and that so, was established. Yeah, I so mean, Heaven Thursday night at Heaven was correct. Techno, yep, and. Before it got, because you know, fuck, it ended up being time warp at the end. Well, like, so, on Wednesday, yeah. yeah. Oh, we, and then next night was like techno, like and chemistry uh, or yeah, chemistry. radius. Yeah. Yep. So you were dead set against uh, Heaven, which is easily the biggest and best club. It was at the, at the, at time, the time. Yeah. I mean, that eleven, twelve hundred person capacity, yep. something like that. Yeah. And, and that in Adelaide, that was the place, and evidently any big name DJ played there. Totally. Like. That, that's how it Well, worked. they had the prodigy there. They had Sasha, Paul Oakenfold. That was for the opening weekend. Yeah. So, you know, the place got Chris and Gooden proper. Yeah. And I think when you see the the way that things are now, do you, well, definitely not now, but you know, that lineup and that ability to go into places and Adelaide, because technically it's almost, oh, there's nothing to do. Well, there's it's like any place. You just need to know where to go, don't mm. you? Yeah. And there's always something to do. Always. So if you go back into the early days, you talk about events, 
you know, it, you talk about, I don't know, recovery or like light square or, you know, there was something on all the time yeah. and at any time. So you could sleep in and go out on Sunday morning and still be able to go to a club. Uh, you don't see that anymore? No. Well, I mean, if I was having this conversation with you in February, um, it would be a completely different thing. I mean, I've been lucky enough to be one of these DJs now. I'm still working uh, one or two gigs a week. Yeah. Um, albeit, you know, with the massive changes that we've had to make um, for the venues themselves, the efforts that they're putting in, the ones that are actually um, music oriented. And I don't know if I can mention names yeah, here. Yeah, mention whatever you want. <clears throat> Bank yeah. Street Social, fucking yeah. those guys are killing it. Um, they've put DJs back on as soon as they possibly could, to just as a trial run, just to yeah. see how it would, you know, go. Yeah. Um, and credit to them, it's been fantastic playing there over the last few months. Because of a couple of interesting factors, and it wouldn't, I don't think everyone's outlook would be the same on this, but lo love the opportunity they've given us to play in there. Um, but the thing is that at the moment, we can't have people dance. Oh, I, I mean, thought, hang on, I thought you could dance as long as you didn't have a drink. Dude, no. The current restrictions, this is in SA, yeah. so it's different in different regions across yeah. Australia and across the world. <clears throat> But one of the one of the interesting factors is that yeah they they if you've got a drink, the as we sit, sit here right now, you've got to sit down. Yeah, there's no idly hanging at the bar. Yeah, they'll usher you in and explain you need to have a drink. You need to go and sit down over there. At no stage are you allowed to dance, drink in hand. Not doesn't matter. And I've seen people be asked to leave as a result of them having to you know try and dance. Yeah, you know, people have a few drinks. They hear something they yeah. like. They want, could naturally want to have a. A groove. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the therein lies the beauty because for me, um, I'm relishing in the fact that I have 6,000 records at home that nobody knows <laughs> and uh, they're really deep and I'm the only one, you know, and I'm not the only one that gets it, but man, I'm just loving hearing these tunes played loud without the, you know, with an amazing sound system. The nature of needing to get people up and boogie. And yeah, the, <clears throat> this void sound system the boys have just put in there. <clears throat> yeah. It's next level. It's like when you get a HD TV and you just want to watch your favourite movie on Blu-ray because this is the latest standard. Yeah. Well, this is what it's like with this music now. So yeah, it's changed a lot. And they've got this, you know, Mark 7 Technics 1200s in there and this beautiful wood grain uh, uh console they've had built up cost them like four and a half grand something ridiculous looks like an old style mono um radio with the felt thing along yeah. the bottom grid and oh man it's absolutely nuts and big thick hunks of granite underneath each of the tone uh stabilizing the the the, the techniques um so you can really see i'm getting off on that whole yeah, side yeah I, can, I can clearly um, see well, <clears throat> and i would hope that you would but it's funny playing music loud it's just always better yeah yeah appreciating but, it but yeah not having that um focus on getting people up to boogie yeah hasn't really affected my ability to go in there and make sure people are, are enjoying an appropriate vibe because so long as there is someone sort of tapping their toes or nodding their head so long as they're not up hands in the air that's as far as we can take it right at the moment so so with being a DJ, you're forever having to accommodate for the situation that you're in, um, I'm assuming, uh, unless you're someone like Nigel who seems to do what he wants. But it, do, you, do you feel that that's a big part of where you play? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> with a residency, I mean, having played places like Cargo Club or um, even places like Sugar, yeah, you kind of already know – the lie of the land. You sort of got a feeling for the type of crowd that it will encourage, you know, that will frequent the venue. Um, so you've got to sort of, you know, these are where the flags are, swim yeah. between them. <laughs> but you're right, Nigel's flags either <laughs> don't exist uh, uh, or the tide is out or <clears throat> whatever it is. Yeah, it's... Um, so, so with that, does that... Do you put your pressure on yourself to play? Because you must sometimes think, fuck, I want to play what I want. Or then there's other times, oh, I've got to. Well, this is what I'm, I think I'm, I'm referring to right now is I. Playing what you want. Realistically, are playing more or less what I would be programming, providing I wasn't given any emphasis to make yeah. people dance. Yeah, yeah. Because ultimately, that's what it's. We're, we're trying to sell drinks, you know, help people have a good time, yeah. stick around, enjoy it. Music is the connector for all of that. So if you can wear people out on the dance floor, 
to a point where, and I, I used to call it the planet anyway, the art of the bar dance floor rotation, which suggests that every 15 to 20 minutes or so, you can alter the genre or the style up so that those people that are dancing and having a great time will have a chance to take a break, go to the bar, get a drink, make room for those that like the other style of music that you've just swapping into. <laughs> and that's, that's the way you sort of flow. So it's every three or four songs. Change the style up ever so slightly, you know, so it's a little more vocal or less vocal if JP's in the house. You know? <laughs> Get that instrumental shit cranking. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, that makes sense, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it totally makes sense. <clears throat> so if <clears throat> if we talk about the arc, do you remember Kirsty Wicker? Yes, know. absolutely, yeah, dear friend. Well, you, you want to hear my arc story? So I was, let's say I was young, maybe not 18. Um <laughs> As, a few of us were. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I looked about 12, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I kind of looked like COVID, like really young. And and I was sitting there going, okay, well, we're not getting anywhere. And I was really good friends with her brother. And we rock up to the ark and she, she would like obviously sneak us in. <laughs> go in, she'd say, just stay up here. Don't fucking move around. Like, <laughs> stay right stay, there. Stay right there. And that's when she I- She wasn't a bossy person at all, was she yeah. really? <laughs> But, you know, then I felt like a rebel. I'm going to the bar, get a drink. I was like, and and it's, it's even interesting enough to go that I was there for the music. I was actually dancing all night. And, you know, yeah, you would have some drinks and whatnot, but that was my real, okay, that's, I think, I've heard some big names there. I, you could name them. I, I probably can't remember. I From even, the Arkham I don't think Carl Cox has <clears throat> been Carl Cox was yeah. the first, yeah. yeah. Jan yeah. 7, 93. Um, yeah, see, that's I was I was definitely heard him play there, and that was like, yep. whoa, this is amazing. We actually had to go and collect him in those days because I'd do some artist liaison driving, which I've got a funny story for you that involves Mick Jagger and that in a minute, which we'll do, uh, yep. which I think we should do. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, uh, you know, Jeff would be like, oh shit, um, the DJ's here, you know, whether it be Lenny D or whoever's, like, oh shit, you know, it was an afterthought back in those days. It's not like these days. There's a whole squad of dudes that are <laughs> looking after them, you know, the ass liaison. Posse, you know, where there's a group of them at the hotel and there's a at the airport and all this. No, nah, man, in these days, you go get Cole Cox in your Chrysler Galant. <laughs> right? You go get him in your car. And the thing is, the driver's door didn't even open in this car. So you'd have to like hop in and just slip across the, you know, the park breaks up. I was like, you know, and then Carl, like, he's not a small dude. No, nah, he's <laughs> like, not a small dude. In the front of the car, I was like, where do I stick my records? It's like, man, back seat, you know, whatever. Um, I wasn't actually driving my car at the time, but a friend of mine was, and he just said, mate, it was the most ridiculous thing, getting Carl to be picked up in this 1973 Chrysler Glant, which actually looked like the wheels were going to fall off. Because if you look at it uh, and initially, they, they were all started the underground movement. Yes. And and Carl Cox is, you know, I t you talk about now, most people – you would think have heard of him because he's been the amazing. The three-deck legend, that was the thing. Yeah. No one else was really pioneering that and then, that level of <laughs> technical ability. Yeah. It was incredible. And to see him play, he, he is very good with the crowd. Oh, man. And he adapts to situations yep. amazing. Like, I've said so How many- How many times have you seen him, JP? Yeah. Um, oh, at, at least 10. You'd see. So yeah. there's not many so, people of our ilk that could say that oh, they've seen him oh, any less than that. Yeah. If you're into electronic yeah. music, he's been here that many times, you'd be crazy not to go. Correct. And you I'm be. now, if I see it now, I'm like, yep. Yeah, we're in. Uh, yeah, correct. And, Sign me up. And I see that he has so many different styles that he can play. He can be in you know, Ibiza on a beach or he can very be- Very versatile. At a, yeah, a three in the morning. So I don't, probably don't do that anymore, but, you know, a very versatile DJ. Yeah. When you're talking about crazy DJs, um, you know, for me, he's the one that sort of went, oh, okay. And then from there, I, I went into- you know, Joey Beltram, yep. which uh, he was one of the first raves I saw, Adelaide Grand Prix, I think Yeah, was. yeah, that was at the, um, that was at my the warehouse, first, yeah. That was my first uh, rave. And I, I remember going, I went by myself because no one else, none of my mates wanted, like, they were like, oh, I'm not going. Weren't into it. They weren't into it. And I went there, ended up meeting people as you usually do. And in the end... Yeah, I caught a cab home with no money and I, I had to say to the cab guy, he went through McDonald's, got a water. You could get free cups of water because I fucking yeah. had nothing. Mm. Right? And then I said, oh, dude, I promise I'm coming out, but I've got to go inside and get some money because I had no money on me. So that's when I heard Joey Beltram. Right. And I was like, damn, that is insane. And, uh, you, you know, he, he really put it together with the minimal tech. That's probably my real minimal techno sort of stuff that I, I really enjoy that style. And, and to watch him mix there was really, 
okay, that's the style I sort of like. And that sort of style changed the way that I started to buy vinyl. So a lot of my vinyls. New York techno yeah. DJ versus a UK rave DJ. Rave DJ. Totally different. Totally different. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah, totally. The only thing that's similar is that they're both playing vinyl and standing on a stage. But yeah. Other than that, yeah. Couldn't uh, be two different animals. And to listen to the the music that they both produce at any point in time, I'm one, I can get into pretty much any music except for vocals. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but but to me, it was like, okay, that's what did it for me. And that set the tune for, oh, I really like this. Hmm. And uh, yeah, so that's what I continue to start with. Who, did you have a DJ that you was a standout for things that, the way that you looked at music? Oh, yeah. I, there was a set. By the guy called Kevin Saunerson, yeah, that I was um, lucky enough to have witnessed. Uh, it was at the Big Ticket on a bloody Thursday night or something like this, and um, from inner city, of course. So he's a Detroit guy. He's possibly um, uh, known for coining the the term techno, or he and Derek May and yep. the boys back in those oh. days, um, because yeah, when they released um, Big Fun and um, and Good Life. On a particular label, um, yeah, it was like techno music was branded on that UK label, oh, so the US label, and um, that's sort of seemingly where it emerged in terms of a whether it was European or it was borrowed from this way. I mean, you know, there's always uh, you know, craft work have been around a lot longer and all this kind of stuff, but um, ideally, that the term I think was coined around that sort of period. But I was intrigued to go and see this guy play in that I'd heard about him, but in those days, again. JP, it was very limited in terms of the information yep. that you could yep. get on an artist. Yeah. You couldn't just dial it up on the net and no. discover oodles about the dude. You just sort of read, understand what you read on the street mag, the core magazine or whatever it was that was kicking around at the time. Um, so, um, yeah, a little bit of a metal blank there for some reason. Uh, Kevin Saunerson. Kevin Saunerson. Oh, my God. It was so memorable. Yeah, <laughs> so memorable. I can't remember what I'm talking about. So I just sat and went, listened to this guy's set you know, three hours or whatever he played. I recently heard a true story from Phil Hardy, who I actually spoke to a little bit earlier today. He's another old, old, old school uh, DJ, um, PhD. And apparently that night he played on a cigarette machine that was tilted sideways because they didn't have something that was the right height for Kevin. So they actually unplugged the darn thing, dragged it across the stage, popped it there. Really? Turn his on top. No one could buy smokes for the night. <laughs> <laughs> Probably saved people, plenty of people's lives. But um, yeah, that was a really... Outstanding set that you know, even though I can't remember the exact details because it was so many years ago, um, that to me was just such a monumental step forward musically than almost anything um, that I'd been exposed to locally. Just having gone to regular places, that is until you'd sort of seen GT play or HMC do his thing, oh. and suddenly you know you've got this Australian version of that, which you know, in HMC. many ways, yeah, <clears throat> like wow. Uh I have a mind blown of watching him DJ. Yeah. So we were at, I reckon it's, I, I don't know why, but I think it's now press, the press restaurant. It was the upstairs of. Um, okay. On that building. Yeah. Yeah. Wayne so Mouse. if it wasn't there, it was somewhere next to it and he was playing, it was packed and I was having a good time and I was close, like to here, like, and I, I'd go and I'd be the one sort of watching the whole time because it was really only vinyl. There was no. Correct. It, it was beat mixing, with no, no repeats or I don't no loops. It was it was <coughs> solid beat mixing from vinyl. Analog. Yeah. Is that is that it? Yeah. So so I watch it these days. I can't even keep up with the kids, but I'll get onto that later. But when I was watching, I was like sitting there and I, and I I'd, I was watching quite intently and was touching touching, and then I actually figured out he was going backwards on the record perfectly beat mixed with the record going mm. forwards and I was like huh? and I just remember going what the fuck I've never seen that before and I was like holy I mean probably heaps of people were doing it but to see it and I was like holy shit and he he for and he's an Adelaide guy um, <coughs> only met by talking wouldn't have a clue who I am probably it's probably like most of his fans but fuck. well the, the modern day version that people would know of him is called late night tough guy Okay. So in recent years, he's emerged as one of the world's most well-respected DJs, not just because um, of the edits that he's done and the you know countless decades that he's been out there doing it, but just that he's a complete scientist at what he does. And it's incredible to, when he's on point 
and he's there in the moment. It's just like, wow. Like, like you said, it's just, you know, it manipulates all, all parts. Of yeah. Uh, and mind. And, uh, and he had like so many tracks. I mean, you're probably going to ask what they are, but yeah, LSD and, and all those tracks that came out. His own at, at 5 a.m. Yeah. or 6 a.m. I yep. can't, can't quite remember, but fuck, they were mind-blowing. Yeah. Bonkers. Yeah. I remember him coming back from Europe on one of his trips because he he never liked flying. That was the that was the thing with Cam is he never liked traveling. He was he was afraid to, and once he finally sort of overcame that fear, that's when he has you know well pre COVID naturally just spends more than half of his time overseas just playing solid gigs with you know Dimitri from Paris and Joey Negro, all these absolutely you know established names in the in the in the game. Um, but Cam is is yeah he's he's something very very special yeah yeah and with regards to producing because he was producing um, early in the piece yeah, yeah. So, so he's so, so you know um, come on come on <laughs> oh um, come yeah on, yeah exactly yeah. So that yeah, was, yeah I was like <clears throat> that's the B side oh, of freaking uh, yeah, yeah. freaking is freaking, like yeah. fuck on like, Dirty House Records oh that's my, their first the Dirty House label, Record yeah. label and yeah. I know I've got a bloody lot of them. I'm like, they're, they're the sort of tracks that you just sit with a few, like with your mates and just sit and try and work out so many different combinations between yeah. them because they all go so well. It's like Meccano. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Which way are we going to drill these bits together? You know? Yeah. And, and you could, and it, it's, it was like it was meant to do that. And he, mm. he's one dude and, and an Adelaide artist, another amazing person coming out of this yeah. country producing music around the world. Like, but very, very unique in that not only is he an awesome DJ incredible producer and it's a very rare beast that you encapsulate both of those in the one person you either have one or the other yeah you know exceptionally crazy dj like wow and you know has dabbled in production or the other way around but cam's just got it all dude and yeah. and with this late night tough guy stuff that's where he's actually sort of you know he's reworked toto africa and, and all of these tunes that we would have grown up with as kids but just puts this crazy solid kick drum into them and you know all of the trimmings that it requires to bring it to the dance floor in 20 you know whatever I, that's awesome so he's he's one of my so hit, favorites. yeah hit, hit soundcloud and listen to the 200 edits that he's done you won't be disappointed really yeah it's ridiculous. okay all right uh, well there you go Fire there you go <laughs> so so with regards to you, you know you mentioned one dj was there any other djs that you'd sit there like you know you've you've actually played at the same time or same card like yeah. jeff mills cj Boland, paul oakenville Tony yeah, DeVitt, yeah, actually, Graham Park, Claude Pl yeah. Young, oh, must, Speedy you must have Jay. A, you must have a list of all the DJs I've played with. Um, yes, you probably have. Uh, um, Miguel Miggs. Yes, yep, yep, yep. Been lucky enough to grace the decks with that motherfucker too. <laughs> so, um, so that, what one of them that you've spoken, you've you've got, you must have met a lot of characters other than yeah. Uh, you know, you did you do much with Uzi or Angus yeah. Uzi? Yep. Like all of their music was amazing. Yep. Uh, Noddy. Yep. Yep. Um, MPK? That was, yeah, part of the uh, instantaneous production crew, which there became, you know, something else later down the track with all the rave productions and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, well, that's they were the first guys to st start uh, underground raves, basically. Yeah, yeah totally. And oh, it, apart from um, Paul Hodder, oh, um, larger than yep, life. Yep. Um, so, you know, he's kicked off to the rave, rave one and, and et cetera, you know. And so, the, yeah. I mean, that was going back a while when you actually had to hustle to do the stuff. Yes, And totally. these days... You know, is it a bit harder to do? Uh, is anyone putting on underground raves? Well, that's know. it. Like, uh, I uh, mean, I personally aren't getting in the mix with it myself for uh, probably you're too age old. reasons. Is that you're too old, mate? Yeah, you rock up. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, even if <laughs> you wrong. wanted, even if you wanted to sort of get a gathering like that going these days, I'd hate to imagine the fines that the government could be issuing to people for, you know, breaking social distancing. I mean, you know, I've just been invited to our kids' um, sports day at the at Keswick, and we've been instructed that um, not only you're not allowed to go out on the arena because your kids are out there and you could yeah. be contaminating one another or whatever it goes. Because there's so you've many got to, people. You've got to stay in the stand and you've got to be 1.5 apart. The canteen's not open. If you want to use the toilet, you've got to go all the way around the other side of this, 
you know, it's, you know, it's. But we're quite happy to have fifty thousand people at an AFL grand final. This is the come on, interesting that's ridiculous, isn't aspect it? Of it all, yeah. Um, so yeah, these questions at this time, man, it's really hard to 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 answer because I mean, I'm not a part of the underground dance community, but the risks involved in trying to just get something like together in this day and age, man, it's it's all almost completely primitive. I'm sure this this to me seems like a great opportunity. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, we've got a warehouse right here. Let's go. Open the door. Okay. But, but the reality is when we're, we're really lucky in SA, we've done a great job. We've got yep. zero cases or, you know, Next one, or two, whatever. Yep. Uh, don't you think this is how raves actually started? Well, it was that. Being well, told, well, you couldn't, you're not allowed to put on events. People didn't like the music. Yep. Weren't allowed to stay open late. Now, now they close things so you can't be up all night. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah, and now you've got drink rules where you can't, if you walk out of that restaurant to to go somewhere else, you can't get back in, a rest, a club, you can't yep. get back in. Like, lock, lock out laws and so yeah, on. Yeah, like. Just making it ridiculous to be a human. <laughs> yeah, so so isn't that like where people, that, and I believe that's probably where the opportunity came for some of the early day, like, like Ultra World was probably, that wasn't early days, but that was probably the first big Yep. Big grave? Yep. Yeah, totally, yeah. Yeah, like that um, was one that was like, oh, I remember going and got dressed up. No, I actually saw some photos of it. Um, that was to me was when the first, dis- but before that, there was some cool stuff happening at the Port mm. Adelaide sheds there right behind the cop station. Yep. Um, you know, all fully underground. And, yep. you know. Fascination. Fascination, <laughs> yeah. Like everyone was having a good time. Mm. Multi-level. Yeah. Jigsaw parties at, oh, you know. Jigsaw. Oh, alongside yep. there in Theverton. So, so why why ha- is it but too hard to do now, or are people too scared because you put a name to it? It's really I'm totally the wrong dude to ask. It's yeah. as simple as that. Like I mean, I know that there are movements, you know, of uh, of younger folk who are you know that are just emerging as artists themselves and getting into the music and all that kind of thing. I mean, um, not going back that many more years. Um, yeah, I could see it all popping. No doubt about it, yeah. on that next wave of crew as they're coming through. Yeah. And therefore, you know, running these kind of illegal parties is, is you know, what they were called back in the, in the days of the illegal and there's legal. And it just meant that have you got a fence around? Are you going to have oh, a credit know, toilet? Things, uh, yeah, you know, there that shouldn't be. I mean, which, which doesn't make sense because at the end of it, even the legal stuff seemed as though they were under catering for, you know, yeah. the environment and therefore some of these illegal ones were the ones where they're actually giving a shit and making sure that all the right measures are being taken, that there are, um, you know, AMBO officers on called in case or something like that. Yeah. But, yeah, it's um, – Well, I mean, it's one of those things, uh, you know, if you talk about the dr- – people associate drugs with raves and, you know, the media did a great job of saying that anyone that goes to a rave party is a – you know, a drug user or, a, you know, they're an addict and things yep. like that. You know, it, the, the the fact is the number one killing drug on the planet is the number, both of them, alcohol and tobacco, tobacco are, both, are both legal yep. and it seems to be quite okay. Um, yeah. So Ask the government about <laughs> how much they make in uh, tax on so, both those products. Uh, and and for me, that's the fundamental problem is there's always someone on the kickback yep. um, coming through. There's a financial reason behind it, yeah. So sooner or later, tobacco is going to be – it's taxed unbelievably now it is. The government makes billions of dollars off it. Every six months it goes up in price. Uh, and that is going to have to be replaced with something. My bet on the whole deal is that'll be replaced with first maybe marijuana – and then, which will be legalizing, so it gives them the ability to tax, yep. so they can half control it, um, which will be over dispensaries, which is the same as what's happening in I don't Canada. Know, six, yeah, I, I think sixty to percent of America's. You sure, yep. Uh, maybe more now, and um, and it, logically that makes uh, the right. Logically, that that makes the right reason why it's going to be done is why it's going to be, they're going to need something to tax, right? Yeah. And it makes sense to be <clears throat> marijuana. Like whether it's used for CBD or whether it's used for people's medical use, it makes sense to me. And, yeah, you know, I'm not- well, At least pro- it's a product that doesn't just destroy lives, Correct. like alcohol, tobacco. Uh, yeah. There is no safe use of, of tobacco. Uh, yeah, and people that? say, oh, marijuana, it's a gateway drug, which yeah. I, I could say that about Panadol. 
Like, you know, Easily. It's, yep. it's better than the, the gateway. Yeah. So, so if we are trying to move forward and you do, you know, should it be that, you know, you shouldn't be ashamed. Like I, many countries overseas are offering, you can get your drugs tested so you can see if they're, they're okay and whatnot. Authentic, yeah. Authentic or if there's what's in what's them, in in them yep. right? So if you want MDMA, you don't want PCP. Um, well, you probably don't. But, you know, you don't want other things in it that aren't what they say they are because of the effects. Um, do you think that we should really listen to the experts which are saying, well, if people want their drugs tested, let them test yeah. it well, so it's they all... know? Because <clears throat> you, you can't – I don't think you'll ever stop people taking drugs. No. Well, it's in, a, in all aspects of society, the fact that, yeah, it might seem prevalent in uh, dance music um, shindigs yeah. or whatnot. Um, you know, it's – you can walk down any street at any – time of the day and see all sorts of different stuff it may not be as obvious um it may be you know less yeah more discreet but um the conversation always needs to be um focusing on harm minimization rather than that's the conversation yeah there's no doubt about it um as soon as you start looking at at, from that point of view and reducing the amount of harm that you know, or educating people over yeah. the practices and the use of these types of things, uh, the frequency of these types of things, the strength of these kind of things. Uh, you mentioned marijuana before, you know, that can come in, you know, outdoor yep. bush weed, yeah. which, you know, isn't actually going to spur most people into oblivion uh, versus, you know, the hella bikey skunk level 82 with the AK-47 <laughs> kickback on the side, you know, this kind of stuff is what can put you into psychosis potentially because of the sheer strength of the stuff in comparison yeah. to the regular grey shit. Um, so, and that's just taking that one natural product, but that it's been bastardised with different strains and all that sort of shit over time. But when you're talking about the other kind of manufactured stuff, um, yeah, I mean, we all got to take on a certain level of responsibility for what we do and who we do it with. Yep, totally. But um, when it comes to, yeah, the harm minimization, I mean, yeah, having testing available and all these kind of things, I mean, to see polys hop up there and go on about, you know, it's just going to encourage people to take more drugs. So I don't think it encourages anyone who's not going to take drugs to suddenly start taking drugs <laughs> just because... Like, Ollie's not going to sit there and go, oh, I can get my stuff tested now. I'm going to take drugs. Like, it's, it, I don't think it works that way. It doesn't, yeah. I mean, anyone with a bit of nouse can just sort of see that angle of it. But it depends on uh, what your upbringing is, I suppose. Yeah, and I think it's very interesting because, you know, obviously a father, a couple of kids, um, and knowing what I've done, <laughs> I'm fearful for my kids about what's coming through because what, – yeah. Because all what what seems to be happening as soon as uh, a compound gets uh, stopped or caught at customs or something, they then change a compound and then they put something else in it, which will you know the effects aren't known. Hmm. I'm not saying the effects of MDMA and all that are known, but you know it does change the compound so much that people can't keep on top of it, yep. and they're only doing that because they're trying to make money on things to try and slip through the gap, the yep. cracks. So for me, it's really about being on the front foot. And it really is to be, you know, if people want to do that sort of stuff, giving them the right channels to be able to test their to test their pills or test their coke or test whatever they have, so they actually know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, I don't, I I don't know. I think I'm a bit more liberal on that compared to uh, some people. Like my wife's totally the opposite. Like you know, she, anyone takes drugs is a drug addict. Like she, she's the, on the opposite string for someone that's never done anything. Mm. Um, so for for her, she sees it as only what she's seen in the media. Yeah. And I think it's important that people they form their own opinion. And like I say with everything in life, and I, I say it with COVID, with about social distancing. You, you, me, I'm responsible for my social distancing. Yeah. I'm responsible for anything I drink, eat, smoke, whatever it is. That's me. And then after that, if there's something that can be beneficial to others, I think that's fair enough. But you should always take responsibility for yourself. Mm. And I'm a big believer of that. And I, I don't know why the movement's not towards that. The, the movement of oh, banning this, they're never going to have it. I mean, if you go around the world and pick out countries where they have legalised to marijuana for a start, which is just a start. You know, they, they need to go back and do the, the studies on how much that's affected the black trade, that, you know, how much is the black market come down? You know, are people yeah. taking, are there more people dying? And then evaluate it sensibly, but we don't seem to be doing that. And, and there's overwhelming um, evidence that in these countries where they've implemented this, that the harms are minimised. 
You know, the, the burglaries are down. There's all of this whole, and it's not a question of, oh, people have got better access to better drugs. It's just, you know, the same fractional percentages of people are getting involved no matter what is just improving their quality of having a good time and minimizing the chance of them having a Done. freak out yeah. or, you know, taking the wrong thing. It's yeah. mixed with Drano or whatever. Yeah. You know, who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah. And let's face it, we've probably seen a lot. Uh, Enough, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've probably seen a lot in the, in the day. And, you know, they. I, I talk about, I think it just needs to be progressive. Like we seem to be progressing in lots of other factors in life other than speed limits on roads with the new cars, but that's another story. Yep. But we don't seem to be progressing in this part. And someone, unfortunately, dies every year because, you know, at, at dance parties or events, like they're searching people or they've got sniffer dogs and it just so makes they, people take all their drugs. And then someone ODs and they and, wonder why. And they, yeah, and, and you know, they've got people digging trenches in to try and hide stuff. But like, you know, you, I don't think you'll ever get rid of it. Well, not in here. You might in other countries in the world, but you definitely won't here. And I think it must stop a whole lot of other things like all the illegal activity that's going on with theft and whatnot uh, revolving other drugs ar around the country. I, I don't know. I just think something needs to happen because the scene was tainted when we were definitely, when we were coming through the scene, it was very tainted with, oh, anyone that goes to a rave party, oh, they're a drug addict. And yeah. it wasn't the case. And the media were just hanging on that. Well, you know, with, um, you know, bless her soul, or rest in peace, was it Anna Woods or yeah. something in the yeah. early 90s? Yeah. And that was, I think, the, one of the first examples of a news story that just got blown out of control, stating that this this girl had died from an ecstasy, ecstasy overdose. When in real terms, um, the the report actually was that she died of um, uh, uh, drinking too much water. Yeah, she had. Yeah, yeah, it was it was something completely different. Yeah. Not certainly not um, uh, you know ill affected by whatever she had had, but just over the. Um, I guess um, the amount of education that was available to her and her friends about what, how much should you be drinking, how much should you be dancing, how much should you be resting, all these types of things. So it's yeah. an educational thing. And that's the crucial part moving forward. We need to be far more on the front foot for, for education yeah. because, you know, I think my girls, oh God, probably 10 years' time, they're going to start to go out and. You know, where they're not gonna, I'm not gonna be the best. They're they're number one. Well, hopefully that's never the case, but uh, they're gonna be going out, exactly. and it's like, uh, you know, you just need to train them to make the right decisions, or yeah. to teach them, or to to give them the the tools of the trade to make, make informed decisions. Yeah, informed yeah. decisions. That that's the right thing. And I'm just the things that you can see flooding the market, like things like fentanyl, and then there's a stronger strain of fentanyl that you know they're they're putting it's a insane. like it's it's insane. Yeah, and absolutely insane. Yeah. Uh, and it, it all comes from – it technically comes from pharmacy yep. because they're looking for other ways to have fentanyl patches, slow release. So, you know, once you it, – it's it's a scary thought that half of this is coming from big pharma in two ways that become into party drugs or whatnot. Yep. Hence, Domestically, yeah. Hence, like, anything, like, you know, whether you're talking MDMA or mushrooms or whatever, you know, they've somehow come into a rave scene because it's another way of people feeling good. Hmm. And hence why they prescribed MDMA to to wives of the World War Two veterans and things like that, and Vietnam veterans. Effective you, uses, you know, help these people get on with their lives. Yeah, yeah. John, like uh, ridiculous. I, and I, and I, to me, it's no different than some of the um, you. It, it's no different than somebody being on antidepressants or things like that to try to help them with life mm. because life's evolving so fast. Some people can't deal with it. Mm. And the, this, the, what's happening with um, COVID, it, it's a bit frightening because we're not quite seeing the effects yet, I don't think. Nope. But we're, we're going to see some really scary effects of what what's to happen and, and that – that's going to be a, a scary place to be, I the think. The mental health issues that yeah. are going to come of it all. And, yeah. and we, you know, we would have never talked about mental health in our life until mm. the last, I don't know, the last 10 years it's yeah. becoming, hey, you need to sort of m notice what's going on. Are and, you okay? Correct. And and for me, it's, it's really about focusing on how we can make sure that everyone is self-aware of how they're feeling. Yep. That they can talk to someone if they need to. Correct. 
and, and go through that. Get but, that dialogue up, yeah. And I, we, we talk about it quite a bit because obviously we deal with a lot of people in that business and you never know what's going through someone's head. No, like, no, one no idea what road they've come No one on. knows what's going through his head and you Just don't know what's going through mine. Bit of what's going through the mics, I guess, because yeah. he's wearing the headphones of the podcast. Um, well, maybe that's what's going through. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Fingers bloody crossed. <laughs> Might be going through his head. Uh, do you reckon it is? Mm. Uh, through, uh, in one ear, out the other. Uh, and there's a, yeah, yeah, there you go. But it, it is a it, it is somewhere where you know you talk about politically, and I don't want to talk about po- politically, but it, it it needs to be addressed with yeah. education. Yeah, uh, to me that's probably mm. more of a better way to look it up. You've DJed a lot of places, but DJs tend to find the maximum volume on every mixer. It's, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah. So. So is that is this just a myth or is it actually true that every single sound system is maxed out? It depends on the venue nowadays. Yeah. So there's no oh. doubt that um, there's a lot of venues that might have things set up depending on whether they own their own sound system or whether they have a production company take care of it for them. So naturally a, a production company is going to be, you know, configuring things so that there are preventative mechanisms against them <laughs> Um, yep. doing one of three things, which is, you know, uh, playing music so loud that it's going to force people to lose their hearing. Um, you would expect perhaps that they would have it configured so that their equipment doesn't get... Um, Blown up. Yeah, hammered in the meantime. And um, and number three, I have no, <coughs> no idea what number three is. It just sounds it interesting just sounds- to roll things in threes. <laughs> So, yeah, Wait. but for those first two reasons, yeah, generally speaking. Um, uh, but then I suppose, like, going into the Bank Street thing um, and they've got this new void system, I mean, I know the guy that set that all up and has put it in there and he's just looking to create the best possible sounding atmosphere for that place. But then Micah won't set a sound system up in a room. Is that Micah? Micah Taylor. Yeah. Won't set up a room unless you've got acoustic treatment first. Which is the emphasis on getting good quality sound is the lack of reflectivity and ensuring that your sound system can sound as best as it possibly can with a few little trimmings and a couple of, you know, adjustments. So, you know, that type of effort being put in quite simply means you're going to, going to get the, the best potential result um, without just sticking a great big sound system in an empty room. Micah, so he did my old man's house. 30 years ago. He was probably Mr. Hi-Fi in those days. He was, man. Um, like, he I remember him. Up. He, Psychoacoustics, I think he called himself. And the and the, this, the house is bananas. And I think it was way, Dad was way, my old man, I reckon, was way ahead of his time in almost everything he's done. But his sound system in the house. Was banging. I remember we watched Cliffhanger. There. <laughs> <laughs> what, what year was Cliffhanger? Can someone look that up? We watched Cliffhanger at... And that was one of the first movies that we watched after he installed the sound system. And it was off the hook. Like the, the opening scene with the choppers. Yeah, absolutely amazing. And well, that was Micah. What a yeah. small freaking world it is. And so he's- 1993. Yeah, there you go. And I mean, you know, he's um, he's now doing club installations and, and all that type of thing. And I guess, like I said before about the um, acoustic treatment, he's the only guy- the only guy that I've actually sat down and talked to about it and his approach is completely different when he'll go to a restaurant or go to a club yep. about an installation and it's that care and eye for detail or ear for detail yep. that makes it a better experience for those that are going to frequent that establishment because of the fact that you can actually still communicate while you're in there yep. and enjoy the music at the same time without competing against it. So if you if you could go back over the years that of everywhere you've played – and you're probably going to say bank seat social. Let's let's because this. What is the best sound system that you've played? Well, funnily to? enough, when when Micah first set up Electric Circus, oh, <laughs> banging there. That was so that's really where good. Ben was working. Um, Correct. Yeah, actually, Ben was cleaning, cleaning. the um, acoustic treatment yeah. with some type of steaming yeah. tool that Glennie yeah. had got put him onto. But the Botanic was a really nice place to work as well, which Micah, <laughs> funnily enough, had a hand in. Um, but before this time, it was kind of like whack a couple of JBLs up in the ceiling and see how it goes. But to be honest, there was a place called La Rocks back in the old days and they had these JBL speakers that you could swear were alive. 
Um, what and, a place. And standing there watching whoever or listening to whoever was playing at the time and these things just be, you know, churning out what was brand new music to us. Um, whether it had been played twice or never before or whatever, it was always, well, what's going on? So I think, you know, we've leveled up over the years. Um and and we've been fortunate enough to live in a time now where we really are, uh, I guess, uh, in, well, encapsulated by the beauty of how cool sound can be in a lot of these places. Um, and almost every small bar is now doing a really good job of, yeah. you know, spending the right amount of money on these things yep. proportionally. You know, don't just spend 10K on a sound system, throw another 5K or something at, at acoustic treatment. And together, they will give you a 40K result yeah. as opposed to throwing 40K on sound and it sounds like a 10K job. So that's yeah, and that's, nuts and bolts uh, on I, re- I say this is – so my, my WRX was installed by Micah and we used all the Bose – you know those Bose cubes? Those oh, lovely. Yeah, yeah. And we he ripped all those out and put those through my Subaru. Now, that's that's – that's Next pretty level. crazy. That, 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 that was, but but it was because all the tweeter sounds were just mind blowing in my car. Mm. Oh, that's a good time, sir. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyway, so I stopped giving you tunes to try and relate to. But if you could sit there now, and I said, DJ Madness, you've got an unlimited budget to open a club. What would be the top five things you would look for? Mm. in opening that club oh, goodness me not being not really having aspirations to do so i haven't really given any true thought to it but now you say it it's like well first thing you'd need to attention without a question of a doubt would be um a venue yes right Tick. what else you know where that's where, where? it's gonna where? be it's adelaide well, it's let's, let's be. do it yeah. let's create our own virtual right. straight virtual. down yep so, I mean, I'd love to say down the beach somewhere, but that's only going to work half of the time because winter sucks. Yeah. It's got to be central. So, well, it's got to be how about a warehouse? Well, a warehouse. Warehouse. So, so venue. Yep. Um, then I suppose the next thing is production. So, you know, you want to have the place knock people's socks off when they get there. So, whether it's lighting, sound, the whole kit and caboodle, you know, venue, production. They're hand in hand with the right location, the right level of production. What size do you think this is? Um, well, it's just got to be... Is it planets? Like the perfect is size? Cargo? Is that, yeah, yeah, is formulaically. The rocks? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you, you, the difference between a 500-person venue and a 2,000-person venue person venue yeah i mean it's a substantial difference in terms of the focus that you can have musically um multi-room venues naturally have the capability of divvying it up you know yep. three get or four different crossover. spaces get the crossover that may or may not be a great thing because it's not really a sense of unity when so much traffic between areas yeah so i prefer would i preferably would state venue with one room Yep. is, you know, the way that, to go with a bar that's off to the side sort of thing. So it's same not, music, but yep. in there. So it's not a focal thing to have a second room as well. I don't think that's necessary. So we're looking cargo. Potentially, yeah. So yeah, four or 500 people I think is a really good, oh. you know, if it's an auditorium, you can also have performance. So you can see that there's people, you know, playing real yeah. instruments or a DJ performance you yeah. want to see, so okay. auditorium right. style. Yeah. So that would all come in, in line with that. The next most important thing is to be able to create the atmosphere. Yeah. So that can actually come from a number of different aspects, whether it be who's performing the music to what type of scent is in the air through to you know, aesthetics, a whole range of different you know, gamut of bloody Do you feel aspects. The, you feel a scent in the air? Is it, is it well, this is something that... <laughs> no one really devils with, right? Well, I'm, and I'm that is to, like I think the scent these days is a bit too much spray tan. Well, the thing was, you know, when the tobacco smoking stopped in yep, venues, yep. the next big thing was, oh man, how are we going to cover up bo? Like that was actually the scariest thing in the industry. There's no question about that. Um, no shit. I didn't oh, even without think doubt, about it. without doubt, yeah. Because suddenly we don't just stink of smoke because it takes one person in the corner stink a whole room out. We knew that. So as soon as that that changed, it was like, oh wow, what are we? What, what's the substitution? What's going to go down? Smoke so, machine. Yeah, well, there's, there's there's kind of different scented smoke, and but then smoke machines disappeared off the landscape. So they ne- they were no longer something you could use in bars, or you know, certainly stop 
seeing them being used in clubs, um, it just disappeared off the off the uh, off the horizon. Just who gave a shit about it? Um, so yeah, ascent. And I remember having this really <laughs> long winded discussion with a, a good friend of mine who produ- produces really good trance music, or did Steve Gibbs, um, and he was on React Records and you know a handful of you know, platypus or trance labels, all this kind of oh, bizarre. And we oh. sat down. We we're actually looking at starting up a place called. Um, I think it was going to be called Candle or, or something like that. And we really wanted to have scented candles burning through the place, but then on rotation. So as the night wears on, you know, oh, this DJ's coming on. It's going to sound like chocolate. You know, get those candles out, light them up. And Did for this half really an hour, Did this really we, we never got it off the ground. We we're actually going to do it sugar. Go to Because tr- Drill is all, you know, yeah. arty and he'd want to be um, involved in something that's next level. Let's do yeah. something different. And, you know, there's the vanilla and all these different flavors that you could actually release throughout the course of a night that we know changes mood and we know changes, you know, it's just another It totally that. makes sense. Because you got the visual thing, you got the audio thing, and you got the scent covered, that with a couple of bar snacks, and then all you Done. need is someone giving you a mouth and everything's good. Done. It's like the- it's See? There you go. That's done. it. All right. well, there you go. <laughs> Tony Bretts. You know who Tony <laughs> Bretts is? Tony Bretts. No, nah, he's Tony Bretts. Oh, man. You, well, you know the guy, Nats Watts, you know. Yeah, Nats. What? Yeah, like the cooking guy. Yeah, and that's right? what's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What the fuck are you yeah. eating this yeah, yeah, fucking yeah. shit for? Yeah. Fuck. Can't be. You know. Pour this. How are you going, champions? Yeah, yeah. All that shit. Fantastic. When COVID hit and started watching this motherfucker, it's like, oh, 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 too funny. Man, there was this guy, Tony Brits, um, English geezer, and he was probably in the early 80s, and he started doing this morning show fitness thing. <laughs> You'll have to look him up and put some inserts of this dude. Doing his thing, like, okay, that's it. Now get in a position. And it's like, oh my God, we just pissed us oh. laughing at Tony. Oh my God, you got to watch this. And he was in Death Wish 3 and all these other weird really? sort of cameo roles that he ended up. Poor guy passed away in the 80s or something. Probably way too much fun. But man, he was like this buff dude, had an uh, American accent, but of course he's British. <laughs> but it just, there's a whole packet. Tony Brits, okay. <laughs> Can't get enough of it. So he got us through COVID, the first spate of lockdown, along with that's what's that's what I reckon. That's what I reckon. That's oh. what I reckon. Yeah. Oh man, he was. Oh man, his um, end of days bolognese. Hello. Oh, he's good. We were talking about him today. Funny enough, I reckon it's cool. I'm on it. Yeah, a lot of those recipes were done them. But then I've fallen asleep in the last couple of months. JP, I haven't seen one for a while, so I've got a bit of oh. catch up. You mentioned cooking. We did mention cooking the other day on the phone, and I would love to talk to you about cooking. So, do you, are you, you know, everyone's got the, the chef of the house. Yes. Who's the chef of your house? Of course I am. Okay. Um, so, I guess the introduction to cooking only came in the last few years, and thanks to maybe Jamie Oliver's 15 minute meals. <laughs> um, in relation to getting a grip on the rhythm of cooking and getting the temperature right and watching how things are supposed to cook, fry, boil or not right so getting that temperature right getting the the fry pan the right size getting things ready all that kind of shit which can be transcribed really simply uh in video format but i think i i just didn't wasn't getting it right when it came to just reading a, a recipe and, and yeah. trying to translate okay. that okay so you're from saying, my point of view i love it okay. and then eight or nine years ago I went to thailand for a, a friend's wedding went to a um one of the hotels that does you know cooking clauses Clauses, yeah. clauses. Uh, I'm not sure. What it was. But um, I'm one of the few people that don't correct people when they spell go. things wrong. When they clearly get what the fucking word is. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, some other people around here do, <laughs> um, but I'm not. <laughs> so okay. In terms of the cooking, and I mean, I'll, all culinary delights, man. I love cooking Indian food. Angus Sanders, DJ Angus, uh, man. We hook up and do curries. You know, bring bang a, a, a bottle of a basket pressure as. And have some goat curry, and then have some really? there'd be a vindaloo or something. He is an amazing cook on the Indian front. I'm sure he's with other delights as well. But that inspired me to start Indian. cooking. He's not. It's just into the cooking. And I mean, when you realise he's, he's Indian, he's Indian he's cooking. Indian. He's Indian. He's Indian. Um, <laughs> so the cool thing about it was that um, it's the same five or six spices that 
cook the yeah, basically no, produces every single that, dish, yeah. depending on when they go in. Yeah. But then you've got Mexican and then you've got the Thai stuff and you know the Moroccan, all these types of foods. Um, it's all about timing and you know knowing the heat and cooking with gas in some instances, whatever you can do to put it all together. Um, but I think with that video help from Jamie and then doing this cooking course in Thailand where it was all about for me learning not how to cook for the whole family in one dish, which is how you would make a lasagna, yeah. right? You bake it like this and it yeah. goes that way. As it, you yeah. know, 20 people can eat it. With this type of cooking, you're making it for one or two people. And if you're making it for six people, you just cook it three times. Yeah. And the beauty of that is that the kids want it normal. Yes, you want it. You want it hotter. Hotter. Bit of spice because yeah. I hate to say it, I'm a freak with the heat. Right, I'll push the envelope on it, man. Really? Yeah, yeah. Ghost chilies, I'll do them. Don't worry about it. I look like I'm dying. But I ain't starving, Marvin. Can you yeah, yeah, yeah. hear that only? Q Twilight Zone again. Um, but yeah. So yeah, you love, love the hot like stuff. Hot, hot, hot. Next level hot. So yeah. I got some ghost chilies. Um, give them to me. I like, I think I like hot food, but I don't think I'm ridiculously hot. Mm. Well, I've been to the Jasmine and had the Tindaloo twice. Second time it burnt number one on the way out. <laughs> I'm not going to bore you with additional details on that one, but believe me, man, that's the hottest I've ever. I, I think I saw through hang time. On, hang on, what's the Jasmine? What, what is this? It's um one of the most established Indian restaurants on um in Adelaide on uh, Highmarsh Square. Oh, we need to go there if you haven't been there. I haven't been. We definitely I fucking, yeah, I have take along some bang and red. Quality Shiraz, this place kicks serious butt. It's only just recently been reclaimed by the original owners, and they're back to the authentic. Way, by the it's no longer been watered down with partners or whatever was going on. But they've fixed it up. It's Jasmine on which which square? Highmarsh Square. Which mm. one's Highmarsh? The one nearest um, Rundle Street. Oh, the Academy yeah. Cinema. Yeah. That's no longer there. Mm. Yeah, where is it? Which is like the where is it? Yeah, just opposite that. Over the other I side. I haven't been this. Job. There's like a mall thing that used to be there. And, and what you go, I go, I go, I give it to me hot. And oh, it, go in there. Yeah, the, the first time I had it, it, it involved seeing through time. <laughs> <laughs> a black and white vision. Oh, get fucked. Um, Come on. Ring of sweat like this. And I was out with a whole bunch of mates, like Fazy and all this crew, and we, I'd eaten this thing and, and had it went into the bathroom just like. <laughs> went home. <laughs> Everyone was like, come on, let's have it. Like, it's it's a Saturday night. I'm like, <laughs> like I'm dead, uh, fetal, like, done. Did you feel? That was the first time. And I went back a second time with another mate, Dan McLean, took some really good wine, and he said he could handle hot food. Uh, I'm he tried a bit, and he's like, oh, man, no, I'm not sure about that. And I've just gone, okay, this is how it's done, and ate the whole Tindaloo. You know, the, the, the recommendation so it's not a in Vindaloo, the menu, it's a Tindaloo. Vindaloo. The Tindaloo is for those that find the Vindaloo. Mild. So it's not for Tinder dates. No, 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 no. no definitely no, not no, Tinder. No, this is -tinder like, swipe. Do you yeah, want it? No. There's no left or right swipes on this side. No, 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 no. No, but Tinderloo, like you get him in there. That's the one you're. I've heard some other places off. call it a Zindaloo or something like that. The next level on from a Tinderloo, but yeah, the Tinderloo Shit. is uh, the I'm, chicken Tinderloo. I'm gonna do it. It's a whole new thing. Yeah. Well, I'm due to go back again because I've Tonight. only ever done it twice. Twice I've done it. I don't know if I'm. You've scared. I think you've scared me. Oh yeah, number one. Hmm. I, Down the Japs, mate. Could you feel it? True story. Yep. <laughs> do you want to do red face? No, no. Dead serious. It was. Oh my god! I freaky I'm dicky. Fucking freaky Tempted, dicky. Yeah, mm, yeah freaky mm, yeah, it was, dicky. So yeah, in terms of cooking, everything needs a little bit of a balance. Some people don't like spices. Some people yeah. can't have it for medical reasons. Um, I love it. I don't give a shit. I had some really hot stuff over the weekend just for shits and giggles. Like I'm streaming with sweat. Yeah, had I to be given like, oh, man, wipe yourself down. You look ridiculous. Couldn't give a shit. Wow. I'm Bring a, it. I'm Jasmine. I'm never. I, Bring I, it. Yeah, I'm really surprised you've not been there, man. No, I. It would have to be the most revered, like well-known Indian restaurant <sighs> in South Australia. Uh, I don't know what's going on. Mm. I've missed it. Mm -mm. Well, I'm going to go have their. Uh, You're never too old to learn. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. 
of. Mm. I'm I'm gonna go. So I've never had it. I can't believe it. I'm, I'm worthy. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, but cooking these days, man, it involves um, you know, determining. And I like to make a food plan with the kids. Let's work out the next three four days worth of food, and we'll go. Okay, we're gonna do Indian tonight. Uh, we're gonna do this. Um, How old? Uh, tw- uh, yeah, twelve and eight. Yeah. So I like the, to get them involved because yeah. it's great. You know, Zara's been learning how to chop at school. Yeah. In her culinary uh, yeah. classes and stuff, so that's awesome. She can zang off and take care of those things. Jed just loves to get involved because just he's a boy, loves to get yeah. involved, eat this and so yeah. and that along the way. Um, Mexican is great to do, and something I've learned just recently is you can use the leftover sauce that you didn't use from the bean, the bean yeah, and yeah, meat yeah. stuff, yeah. and just go ahead and do yourself a um a, a shepherd's pie. Oh, Two nights later, just oh. by la- layering out the pan, and put doing up your your sweet yeah your spuds, or a bit of mashed potato, um, a couple potato. of cloves of garlic in there while it's boiling. Take the garlic out before you crush it up, otherwise it's too strong. Mash the buggery out of that, and you can use tools to get the result just right. Feather it on top, throw it into the oven. Twenty five minutes later, everyone's eating. Oh. No way! So I can see your eyes are all back oh. right now. Look at that. Well, I, I did a dish last week. Yeah, I did a vegetarian hmm? sweet potato <sighs> shepherd's pie. Oh, so it, me, it was nice. made with uh, lentils, beans, cool, um, capsicum, uh, or some other shit. Yeah. And so layer, and then a sweet potato across the. How did it go the, down with the kids though? They ate it all. Gone. You know why they Out ate it? You know what I said? I said this is Barbie's. Mermaids oh. Beach. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so I, I have to hype them up a bit, yeah, right? yeah, like it. So each And how dish, old are yours? Uh, five and six. There you go. Oh, nice. So I have to hype it up a bit. So so with some of the other dishes that we do, because, you know, I love cooking. Um, so, for instance, they we let them have chicken nuggets probably once a week, maybe. Um, I was like, oh, you know, because... We're, when you go swimming, you've got to eat within 30 minutes and blah, blah, blah. So I've been pushing this 30-minute thing. So I stacked the nuggets like a pyramid. And I said this is Tutankhamun's Gripped. love shack. Oh, the love shack. <laughs> and the girls are like, love shack? Like, oh, Tutankhamun. Love They'd shack, seen it because we'd watch a doco on Tutankhamun. And the girls are like, oh, yeah, oh, Tutankhamun. Oh. Boom, 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 boom. I ate it. All no the- convincing. Yeah, what was the towel? No, no convincing. And then this one with the shepherd, that nah, nah, my my missus said they are ne- they are not going to fucking eat that. And I went, watch, it's all in the delivery. Watch and learn. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <look all." laughs> <laughs> so yeah, cooking has become a really important part of life now, man. Um, buying fresh from Drake's, of course. Yeah. I mean, where else are you going to shop? Yeah, well, these well. days, ushy schmushies, mate. Let's get to brass tacks here. Get your stuff from people that run this shit here. Well, this is a bad sign. If we're out of wine. We're out of wine. Oh, no, we're not. It's not a bottle enough. Or <coughs> no no point whining about that. Ah, 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 ah. Um, so, so if we talk about, uh, so the, it's the presentation. So what you said is exactly right. So do you actually still catch up with dudes from back in the day? Oh, man, it's been trying times of recent. Oh, no doubt about it. But um, I think- those of us that, um, yeah, man, uh, it's it's really weird. I actually, when it all when the shit started hitting the fan back in March, I actually consciously decided that I would just spend that little bit of t- extra time each day and maybe ring one person I haven't spoken to in a while. Pick up the phone, man. You got unlimited calls and texts. Like there is no limitation on to who you can contact at what time, unless they're um, you know shift workers and or in jail, stab you. Oh, uh, possibly, but yeah. not too many of those. Or dead. Anyway, oh. No, That's hard too, hard. but oh no, same ones. Oh. See, yeah, widgies. Ah, no oh, a bit of DMT. Oh. See, there you go. On there. Let's connect to the, yeah, yeah. I'll rely on Halloween, whatever you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, I <laughs> had more recently um, made that effort, uh, as, uh, well, especially in, in terms of the fact that there are so many of us that are just so caught up in day to days. I think, you know, with the advent of your family. Is a is a really Big heavy one. thing for for a lot of folk, especially those first um, uh, six or eight years. Oh, sorry, uh, months, hours, years. whatever it Fucking is. What you know, are you depending on when you, Jesus Christ, whenever you work out where the fucking back door is. <laughs> but um, 
you know, it's it, it's one of these things, man, that, you know, you do get caught up um, day to day, and uh, but you do need to find time for your mates. There's no doubt about it. And, and you know, real mates are the ones that don't keep track of when you last tried to ring them and all that kind of crap, and oh. it just happens organically. Yeah. Like, it'll just happen when it happens, and it's just like you haven't missed a single thing because yeah. everyone's around. And we have that with friends who are, you know, interstate, overseas, that type of stuff. But, man, the whole world is so much closer now because we are – you know, a couple of clicks or a serial away from talking to your best mate, twenty four sevs. So you you're the main cook. Um, no, I you would. like to cook. You like to cook. You already asked that question. No. You um, just gone from. Cook no, no. I, I, that was a statement. So you're the main cook at the house. Yeah. Or you I'll, just you just think you're the best cook. I um no no I'm the most passionate cook. So do you because do you, I'm across so many different flavors, so, mate. I just like it all. So do you have a style that you like to cook the most? Oh, probably Indian. Wow, I don't really? know why. Yeah, yeah. I just really enjoy the because there's northern and southern, and then you've got sort of the seafood stuff. You have got the uh, vegetarian style, yep. all that. Do you like dal? Dal. Love dal. Love oh. a great dal. Um, oh. And it was a um, one of my clients that showed me how to properly make rice, which is you know the aged basmati, two year old rice, and cleaning the rice is an essential component. Really? What are you talking about, Willis? What you- before you cook it or after? Oh, absolutely no. You're, you're not familiar with the process. I just showed in the thing. Oh, no, no, never ever. Well, not aged basmati anyway. So the process, uh, 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 Pam Dunsford, who has an MBM from from the Queen, she's a, a winemaker, uh, was a winemaker for Chapel Hill, got herself registered, fantastic lady. She showed me the proper way to cook aged basmati rice. And the process is you get your two cups of rice, yeah. pour them in, um, rinse it in probably – eight or nine turns of water. So put the water in, rinse it with your fingers, yeah. not scrunching it because you'll yeah. break the rice up. It'll turn a milky color. You yeah. pour the mil- the water off, the milky water, and you do it again. Repeat eight or nine times until it's virtually no nine milkiness. Times. Who's doing Dude, that? I'm Who's? doing it. I'm Who's? doing it. I'll tell you why. You do it and then the, the results, so then you measure your four cups per two cups of water, so double equation. Yeah. Good splash of salt. Lid on, full whack, starts to boil, low, 10 minutes, done. Take the lid off, fluff it up with a fork. That is fluff it up with a fork, not fork it up with a fluff. Um, (laughs) Sorry, wouldn't want to do that. Um, And it's ready. So I'd actually sort of almost cook that first and just stick it aside and then get cooking onto your main dish so it's not you're not distracted because it'll just keep for hours and hours just like that and you look at the rice and each grain is like big this and it's just incredible like a sumo restaurant on a holiday but it depends on what kind of rice that you're cooking for yeah okay because naturally well, you know I wonder if I have whole, basmati I'm trying to think of what rice I that's aged basmati but Thai dishes the Indian stuff you know the hot stuff I think oh. and the rice just goes nut solar I normally buy it in big 50 kilo type bags from wherever sells big 50 top kilo bags. It's a big fucking bag, just like maybe. It, 20 yeah, 12 months, 18 maybe, months worth. Yeah. Maybe 20 kilos. Mm, it keeps going. There's no doubt about it. But rice, man, what a staple. Yeah, it's loads of fun. No. So there you go. And that's the, the perfect way to do it um, absorption method. Yeah. I don't strain so that shit. The same as couscous. But you'd Potentially, yeah. Yeah. Well, it oh, takes a couple you don't, of minutes. You don't get rid of the, you don't rinse. It, but you. Boil, you boil, and you we know. don't even boil it. You basically put boiling no, no, water in on, and, yeah, and, and then, then fluff it three up. minutes later it's done. Yeah, see, I just learned that in the last few. Incredibly weeks. basic, yeah, yeah, and but so effective. Like as a side, or you know, throw some capsicum or whatever into it. Oh, um, I use that in my. That was one of the, one cool. of the key ingredients key. in the uh, vegetarian uh, shepherd's, shepherd's pie. pie. Shepherd's pie, All right. which is a hit. <clears throat> so, okay, so you love that. That's mm. good so, mm. because. Obviously, we talk about food a fair bit. Hmm. Well, we eat food we eat a, a bit. fair bit. Yeah, well, you just we, said you're trying this to. Time. You, I've you, been just trying to avoid food. Um, you oxygen haven't done a good job of that. Things. You've been the no, first time we've we actually clean, had to restock. Yes, um, but restock. As I said, the um, intermittent fasting that I'm dealing with, the 16-8, you know, don't eat for 16 hours, have an eight-hour window. So this is, we're in eight hour. 
Well, well yeah. So, so if, you, if like you start, you, would you go to Chianti like in this window, or do you like eating Indian well, you for can, lunch you can, or dinner? Well, you could eat almost what you like for those between two and say ten p.m. eight hour window, and then the rest of the time black coffee and water. Do you find it difficult? Love black coffee, love water, especially when it's carbonated, soda stream style. That is the water, not the coffee. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was, I was actually thinking, oh, yeah, carbonated mm. coffee. I guess it's quite yeah. popular right now. I avoided coffee for many years until some scientist, Dr. Carl, someone who said, no, it's not that bad for you. You can have a couple of cups a day. So I will have a couple of cups a day. I, have a, I was having a lot of cups of coffee. Yeah, it can be a trap. I've worked with dudes like who need it. No, and I quit because I need it. Yeah. And I was like, no, I don't need yeah. it. It's I don't need it. I just like it. Yeah, it's a big difference. I just like I like it. a lot of things. I like it. It gives me that, and I enjoy the flavor, but I drink it black, no sugars. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sh- like everything, everything in moderation. Can right? be long, can be short. Black, Doesn't matter. No sugars. Yeah. So if we were looking at, at just uh, at people, you've told us about influencers. You've told us where you, you your best, your ideal club, which you've never even thought of, but the best sound system. Oh, we got to number three. No, of I the think that's five. Yeah, yeah, yeah we parked it away. But if you could sit there and turn around and. If you had endless amounts of money, let's say, or you could do anything on the planet, like absolutely anything, what do you think you would be doing? Whatever Elon Musk is doing. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I'm, I'm sure he's got some harebrained schemes that aren't going to work, but it just seems as though he, yeah, I mean, there's one of these guys that has exactly what you've just said. And is doing almost exactly what any of us would do. You would, of course, I think, just hire the smartest people you possibly find to find the smartest people they could possibly find. Well, that's what they're doing. And then you'd get, you know, you you'd organise a consortium of people whereby you just determine what it is that we need to do first to improve humanity, to you know, make the world a better place, to do the right thing. I mean, you know, to me, that's a no-brainer. Um, if there was a resource, as you say, that could exist along those lines, I've considered it. There's no doubt about it. And most of us would, you know, oh, winning the lottery, what would you do? Oh, you know, see you later, alligator. <laughs> Don't forget your toilet paper. No, you know, some of us would do something <laughs> constructive with it, I reckon. Um, and it would be good, great to be in a position to be able to help improve certain conditions in certain places. And Did you see... Um, did you see Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink? I... Uh, like, so I woke up and watched that. I, was at, I think I was in bed and it was coming up or something. Uh, I can't remember, but I watched it. So that that's pretty impressive use of technology. Yep. Um, anyone that doesn't know, they're trying to use a chip implanted actually because the skull is 10 millimetres thick in most cases. Didn't know that. But some that, thin, some thicker. Yeah, it's pretty much like life, isn't it? <laughs> and and uh, they they drill a hole about a you know twenty cent piece, eight mil, and it sits. This Neuralink can sit flush. flush. And his original idea of it, which I'm sure was the start, um, and this Neuralink presentation had pigs that have had the Neuralink inserted, so all the sensors of the pig were showing on a computer screen. So. They'd go to feed the pig, and you could see you could see it on a screen that it gets it, it, you know, excited because there's food there, and yep. um, it was a really calm pig. But they were saying that's because that this pig had it in. We've taken it out. This pig's got the Neuralink in, and it was showing that they you know they taught this pig to walk on a treadmill, <laughs> like, and it seemed quite calm. But they, what he's saying is for for the bettering, you know, if people have brain damage or if they have some problems with their brain or they can't move their limbs or so this. So can help determine. Yeah, and help them function. <clears throat> and that's the original <clears throat> use case. I mean, you can clearly yeah. see that if there was a case there where you could have all of your photos in your mind and to be able to recall them by using. And getting, extract them somehow, like pretty well, freaky. Yeah, freaky. Hmm. And that's what he's working on at the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, the fact that some time ago he made patents to all of his technologies available. Yeah, it gave them away. Just, there you go. So long as you're not actually making money out of it, you can do whatever the fuck you like with this. I think that's awesome. He is different. Full stop. He's, I think he's a bit different in the way that he's seen 
Yeah, the way that he is doing things in business is definitely a, a little bit different than what yeah. my style. Yeah. So, so what was it? What would you be doing? Just um, doing yeah, whatever just, Elon Musk. No, is no. Doing. I think um, yeah. What I what I sort of stated before, and I think <clears throat> none of us are in a position to single handedly uh, make the right decision at any one time. So it's all about you know establishing a a, a, a group, a consortium, a, a, an organisation that can check itself, can can focus on the right things at the right time, um, be aware, not get up its own ass, do the right fucking thing. Uh -huh. Like it's it's actually not that hard to just do the right fucking thing yeah. for most of us. It comes naturally. Some people are naturally against that or go the other direction. That could be experience-based. Yeah. I don't know if many people are actually born evil. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. it's just a case yeah. of they've had some really bad experiences in their lives that have caused them to react a certain way or behave a certain way. Yeah. And that is a coping mechanism or it's a defensive mechanism or whatever it is that's kicked into their their psyche. Um, but, yeah, uh, that's it. Like if you had a, a the ultimate resource to do with as you wished, um, it's all about consultancy. Tell me what I should be doing and these people should be telling me that that's the right thing or not and let's just – Work it out. So, yeah, it's not really definitive, is it? No, but that's fine. But that's what everyone should be doing, man. So that's it, what the United States of America should be fucking well, doing, for sure. But let's just face it, that ain't no So is Trump going to get in? No. Well, <sighs> I yeah, I've done a lot of research on I, that dude, I, man. Mate, I, I just I, – mm. I, I can't see how he's not. But like, look at the opposition. Like the opposition's <coughs> dying. Oh, is yeah. Biden? He's, he's hundreds birthdays coming up, isn't it? Oh man, it's yeah. It's I mean, be I was I was all behind. Uh, well, Bernie looked like a good candidate, and then Pete Buttigieg. You know, there's a, an amazing group of people in America that look like they all want to do all the right stuff. They just don't have the money. Yep. That's so and whilst it's all about the dollar dollar bill, y'all, it is totally man. So if you um if you could sit there and think of like if what what if you could give some advice right to someone that's up and coming well let's say an up and coming DJ or something like that where you want to give some advice what what do you wish you had known when you'd first started out and what would be your advice to people wanting to start out in the industry today what piece yeah of I mean do what you love I mean don't get into it for the wrong reasons. I don't know what those wrong reasons are, but to me, if you're not passionate about the music to begin with, why are you there? You know, it's just, yeah. that's an obvious thing. Um, if there's some other thing that you're wanting to extract from it, if it's, you know, because it's a very different looking machine now yeah. to when we were, you know, youngsters as to what dance music was, because it didn't have a picture, it didn't have a face, it didn't have an identity. Whereas nowadays, it's just like, whoa. How many different identities does it have? How many yeah. different faces are involved in it? Uh, how much money is involved in this whole machine? But then we've also seen the downfall of all of that. And right now, you know, six, seven months down, um, very, very, yeah, difficult times for any one of these performers to say that they're going to be around yeah. to do what they've done. You know, I, I can only imagine there's an amazing amount of really good film and music and whatever that's going to be released because motherfuckers haven't had a great deal more to do than, <laughs> you know, sit behind closed doors and get it done. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I think we're about to – it's about to explode. That's one thing in terms of uh, artistic endeavour. Yeah. I do believe so. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what the fuck's about to come out. Because it's definitely – I think with things moving forward, you know, things that are um, not taking any brain power to do is going to be taken over by creative works yeah. at some point in time. Which is where it should be. Yeah, which is kind of – it's happening right now. Hmm. It's exciting. If, if there was one thing in the world, like if you could do one thing that would have an impact on the world, what would it be? Oh, crikey. One thing. These, these, are, these questions. These are the hard Open. I'd, I'd love to say it, uh, it's open up a can with one hand, but I see <laughs> I already got that one down. Um, oh, this is a little complimentary. I can touch my nose with my tongue. Another true story. Shit. However, you, uh, see, I've already got one, these, you know, sitting back late at all. night thinking about all these things that you'd like to do and you can't. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, crikey. Can we just go Pass. I don't know. That's. You can go pass. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's, you know, that's fine. It's, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it is the question, isn't it, really? No, no, I've got one right. more. Oh, oh, there's, oh, well, this is the build up to the question. There's one more. This oh, one I'm gonna, here. I'm going to skip past that. Oh, let, let's, uh, let's just let's say, let, let's just say, what, one thing I would say, um, definitely a, um, a time machine. Go back and just square George Lucas up before he started making another three. <laughs> all right, that's cool. We can do that. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. the time displacement equipment is something I'd like to harness. Yeah, okay, totally. It's yeah. there, whether it be forwards or backwards. Do you think that sort of equipment exists? Mm. The time space yeah. continuum. Yeah, I think there's room for it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I like the romance of it. Yeah, well, and, not and just from a Michael J. Fox perspective. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's definitely something happens. I mean, how the fuck can flying saucers get here? Um, ask the aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Do they speak my language? I agree with you. So it, this is the this is the real hard hitting question. We have one hard hitting question, Ooh. mind you. These other these last few brace yourself. I've really put you. Yeah, I've really put you here. Mm-hmm. If you died and came back as a board game, what board game do you think you would be? Backgammon. Wow. That, that, what was that? What was that again? Backgammon. So that there is the most defined answer we've had. The fastest answer I think we've ever... I'd already had the answer before you'd ask the question. Ask the question. So sure. why... Now, can you explain to me how backgammon... Oh, the mix between skill, luck, and good old Greek-style ass-fucking all culminate into one board game. It's just an absolute pleasure to be involved in every single game of backgammon. Um, I was taught by a dear friend of mine, Sean Hill, who is uh, MC DJ Ribs, whilst yeah. I live with him in the UK. It was actually his mother who showed me the art of rolling joints, <laughs> the art of drinking white rum, yep. and the art of backgammon. Wow. So those three things, not smoking, oh, I wouldn't ever do no, that. No, no, just roll Knowing them. how to just yeah, roll them. Yeah. Um, knowing how to drink white rum is really important without having drunk it, but knowing how to play backgammon, how to win is a very important thing. I came back to Australia and had met with a half Greek friend of mine, Cal Aiken. Um, Ian Aiken used to host this uh, Ian Aiken Sports Report, yeah. a famous person on AM radio back in the day. And his son, uh, Cal, who I'm dear friends with, uh, we had these tournaments or tournaments, however you want to call it, um, which generally are seven games or the best of. Yeah. And uh, I quite seriously kicked his ass 30 times straight or something ridiculous where he would ring me up almost twice a week, Tommy, I just can't believe no one beats me and you're just unbeatable. And even Ross Stanley, another guy, sat down and played games and he even changed the rules to try and <laughs> stooge me out or something. Man, I left his house having kicked his ass and he's actually rang me before I could get to the bottom of the stairs and says, man, you've got to come straight back up. I can't handle the fact that I just kick my ass at this game. This is how competitive backgammon is. So if you're not played, please Hi. get on board. I think I know Cal. Cal Aiken, yeah. I can hospitalize as well. Right? Yeah. That's the guy. No That's shit. That's the dude, man. Yeah. Oh, cow, mate. Oh, mate, cow, Suck yeah. it up, buddy. And I could see he would be that person. You know exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 100. I mean, he yeah. thinks he's good at he finally, He finally got me and hasn't wanted to play ever since because he's like, oh, nah, I beat you, Tommy. That's it. Even though he's okay. lost 30 times. Yeah, 30. But that just meant that I was no longer unbeatable. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't figure it out. They make me no cow. That's yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah. So we, um, yeah, we just call it the roll off. We just head round his and yeah, serve him up. Let's knock him down. That game is a remarkably so cool the- game. But yeah, as I said, um, part luck, part skill, and a lot of ass. Yeah, that's awesome. Fucking okay, I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm so excited. Thank you. So that's the quickest answer we've ever had by a long shot. Normally, hmm. there's a lot of. I, I need oh, a lot Monopoly of- or chess or. Chinese checkers, man. You know what the <laughs> most common answer I think we've had? Board game. Trouble. Snake, snakes <laughs> and ladders. Yeah. 
There's a bit of up and down. Yep. There's been a lot of everything. Have had trouble. Sliding away. Um, have had snakes Boggle. and ladders. Huh? Boggle. No. Scrabble. That's me. Oh yeah, that's it, baby. <laughs> Uh, but it's been all over the shop. It's it's amazing. You you yeah, had that straight away. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap it up now. We've got. Are we going to wrap it up with a rhyme? We're going to rhyme it up with a rap. What are we going to do? I can do it. I can. Uh, no, I ain't going to do it. Now. No. Do you watch no. Harry Mack? No. Oh, he's so clever. Harry Mack. If anyone gets a chance to watch him on Instagram, he he is ridiculous about freestyle rapping. Like his last one he did, he was watching a guy playing a gaming like it was a shoot 'em. Uh, it was one of the fir- mm-hmm. first um, whatever. And as he was going around, he, he's so he's watching them and he's rhyming to everything that he's seeing through the game. So if they get shot, oh, you're dead now. Like, I, I don't know. Freestyling. Wild freestyle. Oh, in fact, I'll go as far to say that's one of the best freestyling dudes I've seen for a long time. See, my boy um, uh, Delta, Danny yeah. Scuds, um, yeah, he's my freestyle dude. I just love rolling with that guy anytime. He's just there busting the shit See, off. See, I every time. It's a, it's a talent to do. Oh man, yeah. Poet and didn't know it. Yeah, talent. Mm. Do you know? Um, I, I I can't remember. I know his real name, Ben Howard. He was like back in the back in the MC? day. MC. Yes, he was mm. an MC something. He was MC. It's MC something. I've told you guys before, but anyway, don't worry. But anyway, it's not about them. I'm sure we can come back because there's plenty to talk about. We just really spoke to you today about your DJing career pretty much. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. S- starting here. Oh, I did miss out on that little story I want to tell you quickly. Let's talk about the story of Mick Jagger. One last, yeah, the yeah. Mick Jagger story. This, 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 I've and got it here. Got like, the, Don't forget. I've got the Marilyn Manson one too, but let's just stick with the- Yeah, um, let's, sit, well, let's keep the okay, suspense. So, um, if someone's made it this far- I didn't do I didn't do, well. I didn't do. do much in the way of um, artist liaison and driving and all that sort of thing, but I was given the opportunity when the Rolling Stones came to town to step up and do some driving. So um, I'd somehow got myself in a position where I was one of the frontier runners so that is you know the main executive dude he needs something tells me to go do it no worries so i was asked at the very last moment to go to the airport and pick up this guy who i had no idea what he looked like it wasn't even on the scheduled list it was like oh shit quick go and get him you know um oh okay no worries so jet straight to the airport i got no idea what i'm walking into told roughly what he looks like went straight to the gate or didn't even go in. We've just got the, um, you yeah, know, the pickup pick pick zone. Yep, day. straight up. He's there waiting. Cool, got in. He's like a little bit sort of frantic about this and that. No worries. Got in the car. I have worked out who he is. Um, we've sort of driven back into the ground on into Adelaide Oval and we've picked up Kath Coz, who used to be, um, used to work at Heaven on the door. Yeah. Um, remarkable lady. She'd um, actually got me the gig for this particular show, but um, she'd hopped in and she's talking to him, known him for years and whatever. And they both requested my attention for just a, a brief moment whilst I'm sort of driving the minivan. I've turned around to answer them and they've both at the same time sort of basically screamed out, stop the van! Like, ah, screaming at me. I'm like, oh my God, turn around, you know, break down, look around and there's Mick on the other side of sort of, three security guys in sort of evasive position um, knowing full well that if I'd have accidentally slipped and hit the accelerator, I could well have ended Mick's life. What the? Are Mick you Jagger's serious? wife. Yeah, I mean, Mick's not in his wife. I shouldn't say that. The <laughs> Oops, we're going to need to edit that out because the reason why they um, – no, no, hang on. We're go there. <laughs> And the second part of this, which is actually actually quite astronomical too, is that when they were sound checking, um, and I have no idea on protocols for, for rock shows and whatever, um, we've gone ahead. Oh, I've just gone and walked right out in the centre of Adelaide Oval while they're sound checking. So there's me standing on the pitch in the centre of Adelaide Oval watching the Rolling Stones sound hey, check at Adelaide Oval. On my own, just standing there, it's like, oh, my God. like you know, And, you know, there's Keith Richards basically – lighting up a cigarette off the back of the last one. Like, you know, I saw him do four cigarettes. I'm there for 15 minutes. Guys, I'm fucking train boy. Um, until somebody came out and said, oh, look, mate, you can't be out here looking like at that. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, oh, the, 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 the sound checking, mate, get off the bloody. I'm like, there's 54,000 people going to be here tomorrow <laughs> night. Like, what well, are you doing? What's the difference between where you are? Come on, mate. Get and, of course, that's just a big no-no. You don't go out in the middle of the Oval and watch the Rolling Stones sound check. But um, 
that was, and, and they're not my favorite band by any stretch, but it was a really nice. Well, you thing almost killed. Of, you almost. You could have been the yeah. person. Yep, yep. That but I always had something. Always wanted to derail with my car. <laughs> this is a bit wacky. The tram down at Glen Oak, like you know, always had in my mind. And one of these days, I'm going to like. Oh, hey. At least I'll make the front page of the news. Well, you could have, you could have done that. Done a little bit further. Yep, you could mm. have probably gone worldwide. I think. Well, yeah, possibly. But I think that'd be pretty. Yeah. That'd be a big story. I would make the messenger surely. Well, I don't know. It's a bit hard to get in the messenger these days, <laughs> <laughs> and half of them are gone. Oh my god! All there you right. go. She's so a good one. Mm. Yeah, yeah. She might have made up in shit Adelaide. That's it. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for coming in and giving us no thanks for the opportunity. Hours of your time. Easy done. It was really cool. You you sort of jumped to say, hey, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. Well, here. you know, uh, what is it? Um, 47, 22 years ago, was it? You know, maths is all wrong. Maybe 30 years ago when I started working at Drake's Food Land in Pasadena. Well, um, well, under Andrew, who I just met out in the loading well, dock. Say, so, so he way in up here. here and Andrew, his old boss, is out the back. He's though. there. Like, basically, I go, oh, how do I move my car around? And he's, I go, yeah, what? Pfft. Tommy, oh, wow, yeah, wow, there you go. That's and amazing. And I was just, came in here to say, I'm just about to drop the bomb on JP, so yeah, well, that was my first job. Amazing. Now. So thank you very much for coming in, enlightening a bit of a, bit of a life. That's a, we've got a tame version of a DJ life. Maybe we'll hit a bit harder into it next time. <laughs> Be a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.